Good evening again, everyone. Welcome, 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 one and all. It is good to see you all here and overseas. I think we have quite a few guests from North America as well. This meeting is focused around local, local experience with COVID, and you will hear from our practitioners who have been experiencing and treating COVID. They've gotten COVID and they are treating COVID. And so you will hear also from patients who had COVID and what their pathway was like and what experience was like. So you're gonna have firsthand testimony of the pathway for COVID treatment today. So uh, again, we, will, we expect to have a number of individuals, including possibly from the or members uh, or parliamentarians from the House of Parliament in Jamaica. So again, for the meeting today, we'll have myself, Dr. Roger Hunter, MAJ President-elect nominee for 2021 and consultant neurosurgeon and president of medical strategies, as well as Dr. Leroy Heyman, who is a very well-respected, very senior family physician from Maypen, who will enhance our understanding of COVID, as well as Lorna Chin, someone who is hosting us from Florida, who also experienced COVID. So as we're about to start, of course, we know we can do nothing without God's guidance and God's grace. And today we are blessed to have Pastor Mary Wildish, who will offer a word of prayer upon our meeting so that it will settle, we hope it will settle well in our hearts and enhance our understanding. So can we just close our eyes for a moment in a word of prayer offered by Pastor Mary Wildish. Mary, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all that you're doing and sharing this knowledge with the nation of Jamaica, empowering people for early COVID intervention. Lord, right now, I just lift up this meeting, all of the medical faculty, the doctors that will be sharing the testimonies. Lord, I thank you for the information that will be given today that will share lives. Father, I pray that this would hit the airwaves. Lord, it would go far and wide, oh God that lives would be spared and unnecessary death would be prevented. Lord, that our hospitals would not have to be overrun and that fear would leave, oh God, Father, as we battle this, this issue for which you have provided solutions. And so, Lord, we commit this meeting and this forum into your hands now in this nation of Jamaica. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Mary. Thank you for those for that wonderful prayer. I'm going to hand you over to our chairman, Dr. Leroy Heyman, to lead us into the rest of the meeting. Can you unmute yourself, Leroy? And can we have you say a few words? And then we'll start with your presentation. Okay, good evening, everyone. And um, thanks to be a part of this, what I consider a very well, well, perfect time, time in uh, forum. I don't believe, uh, I believe you could not be at a better place right now than to listen to what we are about to present. I am presenting from uh, Central Jamaica, which is where I own and operate my medical practice. And I've gained large experience in uh, treated, treating COVID-19 patients. And I hope that the information I share along with the other presenters will be beneficial to you as you go through your daily, day-to-day um, -day living. Um, I say in my introduction here, okay. it's a perfect timing because as we realize our hospitals are being overwhelmed, our um, frontline workers are experiencing many psychosocial stresses. They're stressed out, they're fearful, getting anxious, depressed. And I believe it's time that we 
pay attention to what is happening in, in our country and we make sure that we are preparing ourselves for what is to come. The big news was announced today that yes, the Delta variant is here in Jamaica. It's active, over 22 um, cases were identified. And this is suggesting to us from our knowledge um, of this variant, it's a more contagious variant. It's a very aggressive uh, virus uh, running through families, uh, communities, the country. And from what we also know, the symptoms are more severe. So please pay particular attention to the presenters, what we'll be saying, and we hope that you will learn and you will be able to manage yourselves accordingly. So I'm going to move now into my presentation. And basically I am sharing my experience in treating patients uh, in Clarendon. And um, as soon as I can get my screen up, Can you share the screen, please, uh, Roger? Oh, uh, let me see. Um, it's on your end. Let me make you a host and see if that will be easier for you to see that. Right. Okay, hold on. Are you are you seeing it now? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Okay, yes, so great. Uh, so the, the main message that we are trying to bring across today is that from our clinical practices, we have recognized that if we treat the COVID-19 um, infection early, if we monitor you from your homes, the outcome is tremendous. We will see less hospitalization and we will see less debt in this country. So that's why I say it's a perfect timing based on what is happening in our country at this time. So I want to mention that COVID-19 is a real infection, um, as was mentioned by our hosts, um, members of the presenters um, have had the infection, including myself, and most of the experience I have in treating was based on my first knowledge of getting the infection. I would not encourage anybody to uh, try to get the infection for that purpose. And I would highly recommend um, that you don't get it because your outcome might be totally different um, from, um, from mine. So I've been managing um, patients um, since April 2021 this year. And um, so far I've managed uh, approximately 60 uh, patients. They are coming in faster now over the past uh, days. So uh, perhaps that count might be a little bit more, but um, this is my experience in managing these, these patients. Now, I wanna mention from the, um, the outset here that primary prevention is the ideal as it reduces the severity of the disease if contracted. And so for all the members of this panel, I encourage you to be vaccinated because the reports are correct, the data is correct. Those who have not um, gotten the vaccines are the ones getting infected. And on the other hand, those who have received the vaccine if you do get an infection, it would be of a less severe one. So we want to emphasize primary prevention and we hope that you will be motivated this evening to take your vaccine. However, in our reality, where the cases are increasing rapidly, secondary and tertiary prevention must be utilized to decrease morbidity and mortality. We have already seen the uh, positivity, positivity rate fluctuating between the 30s and the 40s. It went down a little bit today in the 30s. Yesterday, it was over 40. And what we're simple bringing across to the nation at this time is that, listen, if we treat you early and we treat you at your home, 
you don't have to end up in hospital and you don't have to die. So uh, let me move on to the other slide. Okay, so this is my flow chart that I have simplified so everyone can, can understand. I re realize we have both uh, medical professionals and um, non-medical -pro uh, uh, persons here. So what do I mean by early treatment? By definition, what we mean by early is day one to six. So if today you start to have a headache and you have a stuffy nose, that is considered day one. And I want to see you in that day or the following five days after that. That's what we consider early uh, treatment. And um, the old aim here is to assess your risk. Um, we look at your present existing medical condition by doing an examination. We look if you have any um, chronic medical conditions, uh, comorbid conditions. We highlight those and we put you into a risk category, whether you're mild, you're moderate, or you are severe in getting a severe infection. Also, we mentioned that uh, the main aim also in this part of the, the, the early treatment is to decrease the viral load. The fact that you did a test mean the virus is in your nose and in your throat. So we want to make sure that we decrease the virus from replicating. Also, we want to treat any early inflammation that may um, be happening because of the presence of the virus in your nose and in your throat. We also, during this time, treat the symptomatic, um, your symptoms, the headaches and um, the stuffy nose, whatever it is, the fever. We treat that and very, very important we treat your comorbid conditions. We treat your chronic medical conditions. We look at your blood pressure. We ensure to get um, optimum uh, um, readings there. We try to correct uh, you um, in putting you into the normal range. We correct your diabetes. We correct uh, your asthma, if, if that being so. We, we, we treat early, and that is we're gonna be very important in determining the outcome of you um, contacting um, or contracting the virus. So as treatment, we use two categories. One, what we consider non-pharmacological, in other words, non-medication, and we also use pharmacological um, uh, treatment. The non-pharmacological, we recommend steam inhalation. Um, a lot of people use menthol, they use turmeric other, and other uh, herbal uh, uh, products. The important thing is that we believe that the, the air um, will uh, minimize the, um, will help get rid of the virus. So that's why it's very important in the first six days. We also assess your hydration level and we recommend fluid intake, how much you need to take in because the virus can leave you uh, dehydration. One of the things coming out with the Delta variant is that the symptoms are more severe. We have heard in other um, countries, they have severe vomiting, they have severe diarrhea. You know, and in a short time, you can get dehydrated. So it's very important that in the first six days, you start to um, correct whatever fluid imbalance uh, might be there. We also encourage mild exercise, which basically you can walk around um, your, your home. And um, you know we recommend sunlight exposure because it's one of the more economical way to boost your immune system in Produce, uh, manufacturing vitamin D. So these are the, the non-pharmacological uh, things we recommend in the early disease. And then we go to the pharma pharmacological. Of course, we're gonna treat your uh, fever with antipyretic uh, medication. Uh, we're gonna treat your headache. Um, we use mild things here, Panadol. Uh, we also use mucolytic expectorants to treat your cold. And of course, we use the immune boost in vitamins and minerals. And the popular one is the vitamin C with zinc uh, supplements. Now, I mentioned there also plus or minus anti-inflammatories. Now, this is the stage of the illness where we want to cut this infection from spreading. We want to cut this infection, the virus from uh, multiplying. We want to cut the virus. Um, uh, we want to treat the inflammation 
And when I look at all the medications um, that has been available, one medication fall into this category and it's the ivermectin um, tablet. Now, if you have mild symptoms, um, like a headache and a stuffy nose, then I don't recommend the ivermectin at this early stage. Um, based on my research and my experience in treating, it does make sense uh, with patients with very mild disease. So if you, if you're, when we assess your risk, you are in the moderate to severe um, risk of developing a more severe infections, then I treat you with that particular medication. I try to, the calculation is based on your body weight and um, how much uh, risk you are. Um, and we use the formula 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. So for an average adult, um, 70 to 80 kilograms, you will need approximately 12 milligrams. That we give as a start dose early, and then we follow up that with another start dose of the same amount, 12 milligrams, two days after. Other physicians use it um, um, more than that, but in my practice in Maypen, I only use it for two days as I have defined. Now, I want to talk quickly on what I mean by home monitoring. As you see, the flow chart flows into um, the home right across the bottom of the, the, um, the flow chart. And by home management, we, of course, you have to isolate, you have to be away from your family members. We encourage you to have um, um, proper sanitation. We encourage you to, um, if you're going to share bathrooms, to proper, follow the proper protocols in putting on your mask going in and also to sanitize when you leave. We know everybody don't have the ideal situation when you have your own room, you have your own bathroom, um, food can be brought to your door, everybody don't have that. So we look at what your situation is and we make all the recommendations. Now our home monitoring that we're talking about here is that I have your number, you have my number, and we call each other every other day, unless you're in the, in the moderate category, then we recommend that you call us or we call you um, every day. We also have an online service, which we can uh, utilize. And while you're at home, we recommend that you have two basic um, equipment, a thermometer and a pulse oximeter, so we can manage your temperature, we can manage your oxygen saturation. All this in the confines and the comfort of your home, you will be managed. So being at home now, we call you back on day seven. And so we move across quickly to the second um, uh, flow chart there. On uh, day seven, everybody's asked to come back to the office for an assessment. And why day seven? From our experience in treating, we realize that if there's going to be any progression of the illness, it usually starts around day seven, and it tends to get worse by the time you go into day eight, into 10, into 11, and 12. So we, we strategically bring you back on day seven. And here we assess you. Um, we check you for progression of symptoms. And we look also for any new signs that may show up. And then we will be able to offer you the um, appropriate treatment. Um, if your symptom, if you remain the same as you were in day one to six and you are improving, which is what I'm seeing um, from my experience in treating, most people are improving by the time they come back on day seven, then you, we offer you no other medication more than we send you back home um, to isolate and we continue our monitoring process. You call us, I call you, and if there's worsening of symptoms, then we bring you back and um, we started to treat you. If your symptoms are, are, are moderate, if we now find signs like coarse crackles on the chest or signs of kidney um, impairment or cardiac heart impairment, then we start you on two other medications, um, steroids, and also anticoagulants. And we use a lower dose than what is recommended um, for the dexamethasone we use. We use two to four milligrams uh, daily for 10 days. And for the anticoagulants, we use a combination of uh, subcutaneous um, injections. If you are moving rapidly to a more progressive illness, we teach you how to administer 
the anticoagulant and we train you how to do, do it properly and we call you to make sure you're doing it properly and then we do that for one week and then we follow up uh, two more weeks after that with oral um, blood thinners or oral anticoagulants. Now, if your symptoms are severe during this period, meaning that your oxygen uh, saturation is going below 93, then it's time for uh, referral. But uh, in my experience, I, I had one patient and I must share this with you. He's a diabetic in his uh, late forties, about 48. Um, he was doing quite well up to day eight. And then um, the family was called in, to, um, it was called in, they all knew about his condition. They sent him one of those beverages, one of those energy drink that have a, had a lot of glucose. His blood sugar went up to approximately 30 millimoles in our units here in Jamaica. And he came back to us um, quite ill. His oxygen saturation actually went down to 87. Um, it was very ill looking. His chest, however, was clear. And so I was about to send him to the hospital when a family member stepped in and said, doc, we have oxygen at home. And I was so happy to hear that good news. He had the oxygen at home. I was able to start him on around four to six liters. We managed him for two days on that. And the good news is that they, they knew how to use it. They knew how to monitor it. And is he called me today and he said, doc, and he's, from I heard his voice, I realized he was getting better. He said, my O2 sat is up to 93 and I'm doing better. This is on room air now of the oxygen. So um, if they do fall below, we have this option of treating you with oxygen at home. So this is something everybody need to consider um, whether you want to purchase um, your small oxygen cylinder with the fittings, we'll teach you how to use it. We'll teach you how to monitor it and your outcome will be favorable also being monitored at home. So um, he's presently at home and he's improving up to 95 um, later on this evening. And we are so happy that he is improving. So having said all of that, we routinely call back everybody on day 14. Now by day 14, the good news is that what I'm seeing in my practice is that 99% of the patients are symptom free. They are getting better. I can see the smile on their faces. I can see that they're ready to go back into their working world or to go back to their regular lifestyle. But no, we are not finished with them as yet. So from day 14 onwards, maybe for another two weeks, I encourage them to rest. Um, we offer them uh, counseling. Uh, we treat the residual symptoms they may have. And the main one that they, we are seeing is short of birth and also um, weakness. Those are the two um, residual symptoms. So we give them uh, continued vitamin, we give them energizers, we gradually bring them into rehabilitation. And usually after two weeks after that, they come back much better and we're ready to send them in back into the working world. We also monitor them for long COVID symptoms. And for that, we plan to bring back all of them after three months. And we plan to test their um, renal function, their liver function. We do a heart test to check the status of their heart. We do a pulmonary function test to test the status of their lung. And we're, we're hoping that we will see what we really want to see, that early treatment will minimize long COVID symptoms. So this is basically a, a simplified version of the flow chart, what I do in, in Maypen, Clarendon, Jamaica. And um, if I may go on to the outcome of what I see based on this treatment, the outcome has been tremendously. One had underlying condition that was challenging to control. I just mentioned in my diabetic patient who went out of control. Incidentally, he called me this morning to say that my sugar fasting this morning was 5.1, is back into the desired uh, range. There is also some challenges I find with persons who lack psychosocial and financial support. I uh, had to call into a couple of companies to help uh, a couple of patients uh, buy the important uh, blood thinners to, um, to get them treated effectively. 
And so we, we run into that challenge. They are unable to buy their medication or they don't have the proper support at home to help them uh, during this time. But they have managed, uh, they call some relative to come in and uh, be there to overlook them, if, even if they don't stay there. So that part is being solved um, as, we, as we treat. Few have presented with long COVID symptoms and that's usually respiratory uh, problems from, as we have known so well from our studies, is fibrosis. And so we do not give them any more medication for that. We tend to give them physiotherapy. And so they tend to improve uh, with the physiotherapy. Uh, simple physiotherapy we normally do is exercises. We encourage them to uh, force expiration or to blow hard out uh, forcefully. We give them balloons to blow in. Um, they do that several times for the day and that usually work wonders for them. All my patients have recovered and I'm pleased to say based on my experience in treating since April, 2021, none of my patients have gone to the hospital and even more important, none of them have died. And so in summary, I want to emphasize the need for vaccination again. It's important that you take your vaccination to prevent uh, a severe illness. And so I cannot overemphasize this. I cannot underscore it. You need to take your vaccination, stop being hesitant and take your vaccination. It works. It does prevent you from getting a severe illness. Early treatment as I've defined uh, day one to six does help but please pay particular attention to the first six days because that's a crucial part of it. If you get that right, then I, I can tell you today, there will be no hospitalization or less hospitalization and indeed there will be no death. Home monitoring and follow-up is preferred by my patients. My patients love the idea. They are in the comfort of their home. They have some form of support every now and then or some of them have full support and they need that motivation, they need that perking, they need that coaxing, they need that um, training to help them um, take their fluids to, do, to go in the sunlight, to take their vitamins, they do need that support. So the patients welcome that. And I highly recommend all the physicians who are on this forum tonight to be a part of this important movement in early treatment, home monitoring, resulting in less hospitalization and that this is my experience and I um, hope that you have learned uh, from this. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. That's an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And we are really moved by your personal experience, which is helping to shape and to, to, to chart way forward. It is without that 20% the patients become symptomatic from COVID. Now 80% are asymptomatic, but within that 20%, a lot deteriorate, maybe, maybe 10%, maybe more. But you are telling us that you had no hospitalizations, including a diabetic with a very high sugar. I think that's absolutely remarkable. And I think this needs to be heard. And I want to welcome everyone who have just joined. I want to help welcome uh, physicians, our colleagues who are fighting COVID. And by this media, we hope to further strengthen you so that you can, through shared learning, we can get through this together. And early home-based treatment is absolutely crucial, as you heard from Dr. Heyman, in terms of getting the excellent outcome, and particularly to allow care to be given right in the comfort and the dignity of your home. Very excellent, excellent outcomes. My compliments to you, Dr. Heyman. My compliments to all the doctors who are now engaging with and treating COVID early, early, early. We want to now hand you over to another uh, senior physician, senior family physician who has over 30 years of experience. I mean, today, from a collective audience of over 200 years of clinical clinical pathological experience. And this is now distilled locally. You're going to hear from very senior doctors within the profession who are treating COVID lo locally 
and are getting excellent outcome. So without further delay, I want to hand you over to Dr. Michael James, and he will share his experience from the lovely parish of St. Anne and the sunny, sunny, nice town, the Eight Rivers town of Ocho Rios. So over to you, uh, Michael. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I know we are from a vast and a diverse population of persons. And um, this is, I think Dr. Eamon has touched more or less uh, a wide area of, of areas that I am also involved in and has helped me to, well, this, this is what has been my own personal experience with treating the COVID patients. Thank God, um, I'm gonna go a little further um, backwards in terms of treatment in, 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 in the early home treatment setting for people to understand that they need to, before they actually have anything to do with doctors and having to do with anybody else, or tell their parents, they need to recognize your symptoms. And the symptoms that they should recognize is the fever, the headache, the feeling unwell, the chest tightness, shortness of breath, loss of smell, taste, and now the Delta variant with a runny nose, sometimes diarrhea, vomiting, and also the cough. And this is where everybody should take part in. They need to boost their immune system. Boosting their, your immune system is one way of helping your body to fight against the COVID virus. I'm not saying this is the everything. I think your vaccination is important. That will also help your immune system. And everyone, as Dr. Heyman has said, that you should also try to have this done as, um, as soon as possible. So at least you have an immune response and your body is has the antibodies to fight against the, this viral infection. All right, so early home treatment, and I'll go into that quickly. Um, so it is, it is even before the home treatment starts that you should be able to recognize. And I think that everyone who has these symptoms, they should take it as a cue to understand that they are coming down with some viral illness. And what's going on now is COVID. We're not talking about a rhinovirus or the cold flu virus or some other virus. It's a recognized virus that's floating around as we go, as we as we are seeing right now. So this is what we should take our cues from. So as soon as you have these symptoms, then even before you have these symptoms, you should be queuing on to make your body healthy. Yes, hydration and all these things. And getting yourself prepared just in case you have these symptoms. So when you do have these symptoms now, you will have had the, the benefit of boosting your immune system so that your body will be at, at, a good, um, at a good level of immunity to fight against this virus, this virus. So here we have the home treatment. And one of the things that we need to do when you have symptoms is stay in your home. Stay at home, monitor your symptoms, be mindful of those around you in other words, not to spread it around. Be hygienic in what you do. Um, if you're going out, keep in mind the protocols that are set, um, social distancing, wearing a mask. And people I see, even in my office, my practice, people are still wearing their masks below their noses, which I can't understand. And they are, and they, and and most of them who wear their mask around under their noses are the ones that have COVID infections as well, and they come do the same thing in the office. So I I I nicely tell them you need to pull that mask up over your nose because you're not doing the right thing, and then you will spread it around as well, and you're at you're prone to getting it because of the way you wear a mask. So these little things are important. So. Dr. Heyman has gone through a lot of things, and which I agree with. And he has a very practical way of keeping in touch with his patients and making it work. For me in my office, it's, it's a simple, it's, it's not simple rather. It depends on where they come in or how they come in, how long their symptoms were. And of course, as Dr. Heyman has said, the first five days for me is, is crucial. 
if I can get you in the first five days and I can, I can treat you and not everybody gets treatment. It depends on your age, your immune, immune level, immune, immunity against a virus or your, your age is important. And I find that the younger persons have a good immune system, who has a good immune system can, can, can fight this virus on their own. And they come, they go off with minimal symptoms, a runny nose, uh, a little cough, and then you, you, I put them on medications that will help their immune system even better, and also put them on medication that will allay their symptoms. So the symptoms that I normally treat are, are, are the things that I use to treat them with is in the in that early early part of the infection, is is the immune is the things that B complex with zinc in the form of Bika zinc. I'm not advertising for any company here now. But be complex with zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D. And I find this, this extract that has been floating around, quercetin. I find it quite useful and I've been using it quite a lot. And people who have asthmatic symptoms as well, quercetin is, is a potent um, um, plant based um, uh, medication that helps in your. Um, it's a it's a potent anti-inflammatory medication, and it is obtained from red onion tea, red onion extract. And I find when people have red the onion teas, this quercetin, I give it to them like three times a day, and just by having it, it opens up their airway. They will tell you they sleep better at night. Their airways they breathe better um, for whatever reason. In addition to having all the other vitamins and also dehydration you have to address you have to give them fluids and the fluids that i normally encourage them to have are, are the natural fluids natural juices you can mix it jamaica has a lot of god blessed um natural fruits fruits and trees right now mangoes you name it a lot of things are on the on on the trees and we can use those to make natural juices which will boost our Im immune system but if they come to me in the office and they have symptoms, things like, and this is a medical management on my part now, things like amino, um, acetaminophen, I, 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 I prescribe that, that's your plain Panadol, Cetamol, et cetera. Um, and if I catch them and they are symptomatic or having some symptoms or they're elderly or they're above age 50 or they have some um, underlying comorbid, comorbid state, then I will put them on ivermectin. And I've been using this drug for quite a while. I can't count on my fingers or toes how much people have treated with this, but I've found that in my own setting, this is me talking and I'm not dissing any doctors here. I want everybody just to give me an ear. And I've been using this drug and it has worked in three to, in, in three to four or five days. The persons have recovered. They are feeling much better. They are asymptomatic in most part, or they have residual, a little cough, but feeling better in terms of their ability to move around clinically and take part in, in normal activity. Um, but if they come with other symptoms, um, of course, you can have the shortness of breath. Then I also use bronchodilators and mucolytics. In severe cases, and I find that if you present too late, I had a gentleman who came to me 15 days into his symptoms. No, that, that is really, really bad for me in, in a situation like this. So when I listened to his chest, he had bilateral florid bronchopneumonia. What do you do with that person? Hospital. That's what I had to send him to. I followed up. It's not easy when you have to hear about persons who have not made it. But this is what happened. But you can, this is why I'm saying recognition, recognition of early symptoms is so important. So people don't play a fool or play blind or play pretend that you didn't have the symptom. Be open with it. Don't stigmatize yourself. Don't tell yourself that somebody will tell somebody else that you have COVID and you can't go near that person, please. We all are sympathetic. We all know what's happening in Jamaica and the world for that matter. 
And a lot of doctors are out there to help you. We're not there to fight you or quarrel with you or make you feel bad. You need to understand recognition of your early symptoms is important. So if you come to me and you still have some symptoms, I'll place you on IV or oral antibiotics or IM if in early cases, plus or minus steroids. And I will, and I encourage you, if you have comorbid states and you are, you are on medications, then I will ask you to continue your medications, whether you're a diabetic, hypertensive, asthma medications, whatever conditions you have, you still continue your medications. And then we will monitor you, we will check on you. We, we normally exchange WhatsApp numbers, and then you can WhatsApp us to tell us what you're doing, what are, what's happening. And the fact of having a pulse oximeter on hand is so, so important. Um, Dr. Roger Hunter has emphasized that. And I think it's so nice to, at least if you have a family who has um, COVID-19 and you want to monitor them, because sometimes they, sometimes they will come with just a low oxygen level, no symptoms, no cough, just a fever probably and then they will have a low oxygen level. That is a big indicator that that person needs to be treated. So this is my take, and this is what I've been doing, and it has been working. That's the result I've been getting. And God has been good to us. He has blessed us with understanding, knowledge, and although my protocol is not in keeping with most of the other protocols, it has been working, and people have been getting better. And that's my little share with you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. James. Um, I would uh, like to take a moment to uh, recognize the leader of the Senate, the Honorable Senator Tom Tavares Finson, as well as uh, opposition MP Juliana Robinson, who is now joining us. Hi, I'm Tom Tavares, President of the Senate. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunter. Um, I'm here principally because I'm acquainted with a number of the persons that you have treated recently. Yeah. And I'm here really to just listen further to what you have to say. I just said Julian was there. Hi, Julian. Senator Tom, can you just share with us how, how, how impactful that experience was, particularly with that one person who will um, keep her, um, her immunity, uh, anonymity as it is, uh, keep her anonymous, but just say how impactful her home-based treatment, what, what, what was your thought? thinking uh, what's your thought about it senator tom well, to be to be quite um frank with you the person who you are speaking about is a very good friend of mine who um, works in a space that i have responsibility for at the national gallery and i can tell you that i know that she uh, without getting into too much of her problem she has a number of comorbidities and her husband fell ill and, and so did she and to be quite frank with you and, and to be perfectly honest, um, I think many people thought that that was the end of the road for her. And I had occasion to speak to her on a number of occasions while she was at home being treated by you. And I must tell you on a number of the days, um, I really thought she had gotten really low, but it's, it's remarkable um, to me that she had has recovered. And in fact, her... People are saying that she's looking better now than before. <laughs> um, so I, I spoke with her and, and I'm quite satisfied that the vaccination is imperative and we should encourage people to get the vaccination um, because it gives you a start um, okay. to fight this most insidious virus. It's not the end of the day. Um, as pointed out, you may very well get infected, but I'm satisfied um, that I have sufficient knowledge now that if I'm infected, I know I'm not going to run to the University of the Hospital. I think University of West Indies, um, the hospital at the University. I'm satisfied okay. that I have some degree of knowledge that will keep me safe. So I'm happy oh, okay. to spend some time with you this evening. Thank you um, very much. Well, and by the way, you should tell them that you're my schoolmate. Yes, indeed. We celebrate Drax Day together, indeed. I, I say no more. But can you just share with us a little pearl 
that you have now come into a space of power, COVID power. So I, I will assign you a, a status, what we call a COVID champion. You're now a COVID champion. Of course, we know you, you went to the school of champions, but you're a COVID champion in this dispensation. In other words, how have you now been empowered? How are you now more comfortable? What specifically, ha- what specific arsenal are you now equipped with? that will allow you to treat with COVID in a more so frontal and a domiciliary, a residential way, rather than going to a first hospital. Of, first of all, I am vaccinated. Lovely. Um, yes. I recognize that you, as the previous doctor said, you you enforce that with um, zinc and vitamin yes. C, which I've been doing all along. Lovely. So I yes. encourage the rest of my family to do so. Um, I have. I, I went out and I, I was able to get some camphor crystals, um, which I know is critical in treatment if it comes to that. And I, I have an idea as to what other medication I am to be prescribed if the time comes around. So I do feel um, empowered by it. Can you give and us a little hint at the other medication? We're waiting with baited breaths. <laughs> no, but no, no, you, the Dr. Hunter will... <laughs> will indicate what those are because they re- I think that there were two antibiotics which were yeah. uh, recommended. Yes. But what about I, ivermectin? What's your view on ivermectin? That's what I'm getting at really. Well you know, I don't want I don't want to tell you that I've gotten some, but it's certainly <laughs> some capacity to, if you have and I think it's it's for three days. I, I yes. you know I, I must tell you that um, I think people once once you have the knowledge and you have a, a physician who is prepared to 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 um, prescribe them for you and eat in advance and get them and put them down and and if you know somebody who has a problem um, recommend them you know but that's the nature of it yes I feel I I I, I don't feel as terrified as I was uh, because I have I have some underlying. Um, I not I don't have asthma, but I have some underlying issues in relation to my lungs. So I was I was pretty sure that if I came down with this thing, it would it would be a very difficult fight for me. But I feel that the knowledge that I've gained has put me in a different category mentally. So I will continue to keep safe. I'm double masking. I'm mm-hmm. trying to I'm trying to reduce my contact. Um, in the public sphere, which of course is difficult, but that's the nature of it. So we'll, we'll continue to hope for the best and, and yes. pray. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, I would say that, that, that firsthand experience now after a year and a half of learning, and that's really important for us all. This, this, this conference here is for all of us to learn, to share, to be empowered so that we all leave here as COVID champions. What's the word? COVID champions. And we take on an element of COVID competence. What's the word? COVID competence. I think uh, as happens with doctors, sometimes they get caught up. So I am going to move on to my presentation, which was really which my whole interaction with COVID started from a conceptual basis regarding where the virus started and where we were located in the world. And now we, I have moved now to a experiential basis where based on treating with the virus directly in Jamaica, we can now make some pretty strong conclusions. So whilst we wait for Dr. Kidd to finish up in Santa Cruz and Dr. DePaul to finish up in Mandeville, I am going to, uh, should we, should we, no, actually I'm gonna allow the dentist, Dr. Dr. Eugenia Hines. Eugenia, hi, are you here with us? Good evening, All right. I'm here. Great, I'm gonna allow you to talk now. And you're going to tell us, because it's very central to the whole concept of COVID, the mouth, the oral cavity. So we're going to hear from dentists about how we can better treat with COVID by taking care of our oral hygiene. Heard a lot about hand sanitizer, but now we want to talk about oral hygiene. So over to you, Eugenia. 
All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My name is Dr. Eugenia Heinz. I have over 10 years of experience. I graduated in 2009. And currently I work at Kingston A. St. Andrew Health Department as a parish dental surgeon. And I also have a private practice. The topic of my presentation is oral health care during COVID-19. So first I want to talk about the functions of our oral cavity. So function number one is the mastication. The mastication also known as chewing. So without teeth, without our tongue, we won't be able to chew food properly. Next function is phonetics. Phonetics also referred as talking. Talking can be affected if we start losing certain teeth in our, in our oral cavity um, or if we have spaces between the teeth. So I'm sure you all heard some people have speech defect. So that also can be associated with their teeth. Another function is deglutition. Deglutition is known as formation of food bolus and also is an act of swallowing. So our teeth need to get in contact in order to chew food into and break it down into small pieces or small particles. And then our tongue help to move that food bolus around so we can able to swallow. So without our teeth and tongue functioning properly, we won't be able to chew food. And as a result, our digestive system going to be overworked by trying to digest those large particles of food. Another function is facial support. So this part of function is mostly noticeable when we start losing teeth. Uh, when we start losing teeth, our lower part of the face becomes significantly lower. So therefore, the teeth support our face. Another important function is smiling. So we all know that when we smile, our body releases the dopamine, the endorphin, serotonin, and those hormones that help us to fight with stress. And also when we're smiling, it's not only helping us to fight the stress, but also it helps others. Because when a person smiling at you, you always want to smile back. Don't you? Also, our oral health can affect your self-esteem. How that can happen is because persons who doesn't have a good smile, they usually have a lack of confidence and a lot of times that can lead into depression and other mental disorders. So another important message that I want to carry is that the oral health is a part of your general health. So we all know that the oral cavity is the most contaminated part in our body. There are more than 20 billions of bacteria live in the oral cavity. And if we don't maintain our oral hygiene at a proper level, those bacteria can multiply and it can reach to over 100 billion. Now look at the picture above. So you can just imagine how many bacteria live in that oral cavity. So poor oral health leads to increased bacterial and viral loads in the oral cavity. There is also scientifically proven link between poor oral health and other illnesses such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, premature birth, low birth weight, cancer, autoimmune diseases, and others. In case of cardiovascular diseases, very important is to mention the endocarditis. So the bacteria that present in the oral cavity and the same bacteria that cause the tooth decay and gum disease, they call streptococci. So while after the tooth brushing, the research have shown that the same bacteria, they tend to go into our bloodstream causing bacteremia. And if we have underlying conditions, especially heart conditions, it can lead to a heart infection called endocarditis. Also, the research have shown that poor oral health leads to increased risk of stroke and heart attack. How that happens is bacterial infection goes into the bloodstream and it causes inflammation of the blood vessels, which eventually can lead into thrombosis 
and clogging of the clogging of the arteries and eventually it leads to stroke and heart attack. Uh, another scientific research have shown that ACE2 receptors, those are the receptors that the COVID virus tend to bind to, they're present in the oral mucosa and especially in epithelial cells of our tongue. So those, uh, the virus is actually able to replicate in our oral cavity and even in our salivary gland. Um, persons with chronic illnesses. Uh, oh, where are you? Mr. Bailey, can you hey, please? Hello. Uh, persons with chronic illnesses are at risk of poor oral health, um, which usually leads to different conditions, oral health conditions such as gum disease, dry mouth, extensive tooth decay, tooth mobility, ulcers, and others. What are the signs of viral infection on, in oral cavity? So we have agusia, which is also known as loss of taste, xerostomia, which is also known as dry mouth, anantem, which is a rash on the oral mucosa, and stomatitis, which are the mouth ulcerations. So the picture that I have here, it demonstrates the anantem. And how can we protect ourselves and others against COVID? So, of course, as a dentist, I would propagate a good oral hygiene. So, number one is we all need to brush teeth three times a day for at least two minutes. So, why we need to brush three times a day? Because, as I said earlier, the um, poor oral health leads to increased viral load in the oral cavity. So therefore, all our instructions would be to make sure that we minimize the amount of bacteria and virus present in our cavity. So this is for those who was tested positive for COVID and for those who are negative. Because as we know, there are a lot of issues with the testing when sometimes we can have symptoms, but we still test it negative. And sometimes we don't have symptoms, but we're still tested positive. So therefore, I think these instructions for good oral hygiene need to be carried across for all type of person. Um, we also need to know that the toothbrush that we're using need to be changed regularly. How often we're supposed to change it, it depends in, on the type of the toothbrush and the technique. So for, but based on the, Recommendation from the manufacturer, they advise that we should change the toothbrush once in three months. But I think that is a little bit long. So what we need to do is we need to examine our toothbrush. So every time we're brushing teeth, we want to make sure that the toothbrush looks like the new one, right? If we notice that the color of it starts to change or the bristles started to point to, into different directions, that means we need to change it. Also, if we got sick, we need to change it. If we got any ulcer in the mouth, any night fever, we need to change the toothbrush. Another way to prevent the amount of, to reduce the amount of bacteria present in your oral cavity is to floss. So there are different types of flosses available on the market. So you have the regular one, which is the thread looking one that you need to use your both hands in order to floss between all teeth. As you know, the toothbrush cannot reach in between the teeth and only the way we can get there is by flossing. So for those who have some physical challenges and unable to use the regular floss, they have an option of flossing with a handle. So they have, they have those handles, flosses in handles, in different shapes and sizes. Then we have the proxy brushes. Those brushes are good to use when you have different appliances in the mouth, such as braces or crown and bridges or implants. And another way to floss is to use this floss shredder. So usually the floss shredder is used in combination with the regular floss, so you need to push the regular floss through the loop 
and then use this pointy tip to go in between the teeth. So usually the floss thread is also used in, in patients who has appliances such as braces or coronal bridges and implants. Um, there is a new thing on the market which is called irrigator, irrigator or water pick or water flosser. So what it does, it helps to wash out the debris from between, between the gum and the teeth. So you pour water or any mouthwash into the container and then press the button to activate it and the water starts spraying and help to clean between the gum and the teeth. Uh, another way to prevent, prevent our bacterial and viral load in the oral cavity is to brush your tongue. As I said earlier, the um, COVID binding receptors are found in our tongue. So therefore we need to make sure we clean it. So uh, most of the toothbrushes that available at the vendors right now, they have a part at the back of, of the head of the toothbrush that helps you to brush the tongue. However, they also have them separate. So you can purchase the tongue brushes separately. So another way to maintain your good oral hygiene is to use antiseptic mouthwash. So the research has shown where that when you use the mouthwash for at least 30 seconds, it can kill the virus present in your oral cavity. It can kill COVID. So uh, what kind of uh, mouthwashes you can use? So you have the over-the-counter mouthwashes such as Listerine, then you can make your own mouthwash. You can dilute peroxide, hydrogen peroxide with water in one to, th to three. And also you can use chlorexidine. And then the last recommendation is of course to visit the dentist at least twice a year. So thank you very much. I was asked to prepare a short presentation, so I hope I covered what I was asked for. And back to you, Dr. Hanto. Thanks, thanks, uh, Eugenia. And we'll also say that we, we are calling for a, a one-month period, a national one-month period of oral hygiene, where everyone will brush, floss brush, mouthwash three times a day, and remember to brush your tongue. Remember to brush your tongue, it's very important. We're gonna be a national month, 30 month period. And within that conversation, we expect that the amount of viral load in people's mouth who some are not symptomatic will be reduced. And that we know that the mouthwash kills the virus within 40 seconds of contact. And it doesn't have to be Listerine, it can be a number of mouthwash that has been shown from last year that within 40 seconds. So I, for one, walk around with mouthwash just to make sure that even should in case I have corona in my mouth, though we know the coronavirus is everywhere, it's not just in your mouth, it's down in your lungs, it's also in your sinuses, but at least for the mouth section, we have managed to reduce the viral load. So thanks again, Dr. Hines and Please stick around with us as we um, we will be definitely having question and answers later on. So I'm going to move on to my presentation now. Okay, again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to those who are just joining us. So we, we, we've now had a period of learning of one year and seven months. And through that learning, we must therefore then adapt, adjust, and go forward. A lot of us have had to adjust positions, including myself, following a period of learning. We hope the adjustments ultimately will go towards the benefit of everyone as we try to safely overcome this pandemic. What is clear though, is that we need a new paradigm, a new way of thinking. We're gonna share our local experiential driven learning, certainly from my perspective, and certainly as the MAJ president elect nominee, we'd like to also make sure that this is very much a part of the conversation going forward. We'd also like to stop and pause and recognize for a moment the tragedy that our brothers and sisters in Haiti have had now once again to endure. On Saturday, we noted that 
within a few minutes, more people died in Haiti than all lives lost in coronavirus in Jamaica for the past one year, for the past 18 months and, and more. So it's very poignant. And if we're very sorry that this earthquake had to be, um, had to affect anywhere, but what if the earthquake had affected Jamaica? Would we be ready? Would we be prepared? I mean, our, our hospitals are being overwhelmed. We've heard it strongly from the Ministry of Health that they are 160% occupancy. And of course, we also had Hurricane Great, or not Hurricane, but Tropical Storm Grace, pardon me. And generally during a tropical storm, you want to empty your hospitals and you want to make sure only patients that need hospitalized care are there. And so this is a timely uh, reminder of why we need to reimagine and to reposition our care. So again, for though anyone who is interested in contributing to uh, the earthquake, the Haiti earthquake relief or the appeal for 2021, already I've had doctors who are willing to contribute their, their expertise when the situation allows to go and uh, have a reconstructive surgeon who is willing to, uh, to participate, Dr. Jan Sjokrit, and I want to recognize him for that. And also nephrologist, Dr. Raquel Lowe Jones from Mandeville region. She's also stepped up to help in terms of her, her financial help. And so we reach out for any members of the audience who are so moved to step up and to help our brothers and sisters at this time. The current situation is that care is heavily concentrated around hospitals, whether private or public, government or independent. In particular, in the government, we've heard the government in the past made several efforts to get patients away from the hospital and back into the health centers. There is a tendency for us to, for us to just gravitate to the major hospitals, but this needs to change. We have a 46% positivity rate with COVID. We heard this this week. At that high level of positivity, we know that the virus is everywhere in the community and every other person has it or has had it. And we're getting some information from the ministry today, which shows that the Ministry of Health projects about 600,000 Jamaicans have already, uh, have already contracted COVID. Others have projected, projected even higher, maybe 1.7, 1.8 million Jamaicans have had one or the other version of COVID. Remember, there are several versions of COVID that have passed through Jamaica. And when I say that, several versions, several mutations, and it's not necessarily that they have been imported because the virus is constantly mutating locally. But with, that, with such a high positivity rate, we therefore must recognize that the containment measures, which were heavily rolled out last year, sadly have, have not been able to achieve their purpose. 10 billion Jamaican dollars was spent isolating coronavirus. We make an appeal that we need to fix Cornwall Regional Hospital. COVID is real, but we need to fix Cornwall Regional Hospital and the powers that be, the parliamentarians who are reaching make a special appeal to you that you look into that because $10 billion to spend to isolate the coronavirus can be a bit of a problematic uh, approach for all countries of the world, not just Jamaica, including Australia now, which we see is on a lockdown. It's very difficult to contain a 0 0.125 micrometer particle. So we have to, to stop, pause and rethink how we allocate funding as we try to tackle coronavirus. And this conference is heavily focused on early treatment and home-based treatment, and it's timely that we should do it. The challenges, the occupancies, we have said it before, 160%, the lack of staff. We recently had the imprisonment of the junior doctors, and we are making a special appeal again for parliament to review that process and the thinking around imprisonment of non-violent offenders, especially at a time when we are in a pandemic. Should we, how should we, should we have a policy? Should we put doctors behind bars if it's only for a second? Is that a COVID protocol? Perhaps it's not. And we have seen in other countries where nonviolent prisoners, convicted prisoners are actually allowed out of jail to avoid contracting COVID. Because we know also in Jamaica, our prisons have had, have been sent epicenters of COVID and we're also seen where in last week, Monday, where 
courts in St. James and Hanover were closed because the judiciary were afraid of contracting COVID. So when you imprison junior doctors, what message are you saying when you put them in prison? There must be some joining up between the Integrity Commission as well as government, as well as um, the judiciary to see how to treat with um, people who may have encroached upon a rule or a law, say for instance, not signing a statutory declaration and see how you can treat with that in a time of COVID. Is that the right time for that type part of the law to, to be vocal? And perhaps I'm recommending that it probably should be silent until we get into a safe zone. We need to also abolish short-term contracts for our members. We have seen the impact of six month contracts on junior doctors they have had. It's demoralizing, it's really uh, disempowering. It doesn't allow them to approach financial institutions with confidence. And we re really use this forum to call for the abol abolition of six month contract for members and no contract should be less than 12 months. The consequence of this, which we have seen, is that recently doctors went on industrial action for one day to make sure to reestablish that memorandum where no six month contract will be given and at least one to two year contracts will be applied. But in the process of the 100 doctors whose contracts came to an end, 50% of them have left and they cannot return and they've left permanently. We saw also where Savlamara Hospital yesterday, the staff is absolutely burnt out. So we have a situation where we're short already of staff. We have further this, this, this the uh, this um, the further um, demoralized staff by the way they are treated with their contracts or even physically putting them behind bars. And so we have we now a perfect storm where the surge is there, the numbers of COVID is there, but at the same time, our effective army, our frontline army to treat COVID is reduced. Thankfully, members of the independent sector that have been largely quiet, like myself, like Dr. Heyman, like Dr. James, They've been largely quiet, but we are now treating the majority of COVID and we're doing it at home. But we need to see a doubling up of will and collective support for our members going forward. And that we should not have a situation where contracts are terminated and a few, few weeks later, you're now approaching those doctors for help in terms of getting, getting, them, back to, getting them back on the front line. It shows to me a very, uh, very um, difficult position. We also know that hospitals have been empty. The St. Joseph's Hospital that was generating over $200 million in revenue was shut last week, last year, um, March. Dunstan Brand called me, the permanent secretary, to advise me of the closure of the hospital, which was a really concentrated hospital for, you know, for tertiary care, such as neurosurgery and brain surgery. That hospital has five operating theaters that have not been used, including the Cuban Eye Program, for all of one year and seven months. The field hospital also is largely unoccupied because of failure to find the staff. There must be a, con a clear conscious thinking between staffing, how you treat the staff and how you can aspire to populate your, your hospitals. If the staff are not treated properly, then you're going to operate hospitals that are understaffed. But St. Joseph's in particular is a bit worrying because it was generating over $200 million plus in revenue. And now it's generating no revenue for the government. And in fact, it's actually, and now a burden on the public's purse. Hospitals are also areas where you get infections. And it has been shown, certainly in the United Kingdom, that a third of all COVID infections were transmitted from patient to patient in hospital. In other words, patients went in, say for instance, they've broken their hip or they had a fibroid or a cataract and coming out of the hospital, they contracted COVID. I've had several, several patients here and some have even died. There's this 26 year old patient who contracted COVID at a tertiary institution in Kingston and went home not knowing what to do. And where the time they deteriorated at home without any treatment, they went to another hospital in St. Catherine and died. We need to recognize that if a treatment can be done at home, we should do it at home. This will avoid the increased costs associated with hospitalization care. So we need to deinstitutionalize care and we must reimagine healthcare in Jamaica. 
Now, the algorithm, basic. All homes must have a pulse oximeter. You must be COVID champions and COVID competent by the time you finish listening to this talk. You will be champions for others who are not hearing this talk. Every household in Jamaica, and I dare say every household in the world, must have a pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter. This is a small device that's placed over the tip of your fingers or your toes, or sometimes even on, on your earlobes, and that can detect the percentage oxygen concentration in your blood. This is normally between 90 and 100. We even accept 90 to 100 as okay. The oxygen saturation or percentage oxygen saturation, we want to aim that between 90 and 100. All homes must have a pulse oximeter. And we'd like to use this opportunity again to go back and appeal to government that they remove all taxes, all duties associated with the importation and the sale of the pulse oximeter. All homes must also have the infrared thermometer. We have all come used to this, certainly by, uh, from last year. You can't enter any public space without having a temperature check. This is the infrared thermometer. It's a non-touch or contactless thermometer. We, and this can be used to scan all over the body, not just your arms or your side of your head. You can scan surgical wounds. If you just had an operation, you can scan the wound to see if that in fact, there is a normal reading of the temperature or it's elevated. If you're a diabetic, you must also have a glucometer. And I'd like to say at this moment, because steroids are very much a part of the treatment for COVID, there are a lot of patients who will become, I wouldn't say a lot, there are a few patients who will become diabetic. And it may well be useful that every household should have a glucometer and be aware how to use it and how to interpret the readings. We're asking all doctors, all doctors, they must report to duty. We need to have COVID champions. Every doctor must become COVID competent. They must be COVID competent. We do not necessarily advocate for COVID marshals, although others have, because we don't think incarceration is the right, to, is the right way to go. If it's only to demonstrate a principle, we need to empower people so that they feel a sense of duty and they feel a sense of wanting people to get better. So we want people to become COVID champions and COVID competent. Most COVID by now, overwhelming cases are being treated by the independent public health providers and they, these doctors are COVID competent. So I know a lot of doctors are in the house tonight and we wanna make sure that you have a very firm footing how to treat with COVID. But the important message that you must hear is that everybody must have a pulse oximeter. They must have a pulse oximeter in their home because you're gonna rely on that reading to see where to strategize and where to cat categorize that patient. Most COVID therefore, as we said, treated at home. Most are in the office. Home-based monitoring of the pulse oximeter with the infrared thermometer. I cannot say that enough. I am deliberately repetitive. It is not accidental. It is deliberate. We recommended pulse oximetry from March last year to the MOH authorities. They were a bit lukewarm on the matter. Pulse oximeter must be present in every household if we are going to empower people to be able to treat with COVID directly in their home, directly in their offices. And for those who are here from central authorities, we would recommend that every public space be mandated to have a pulse oximeter. Uh, by now, today alone, I've treated close to 10 cases of COVID. And it's not hard to treat. Once you get into the algorithm and you know what you're doing, but a pulse oximeter is the basis. Early treatment is very important. We have treated a, year, a range of patients from 18 years old, which was largely asymptomatic, to 104 years old, retired nurse from New York, and she was very, very, very symptomatic. 
She was a doctor. She's a doctor. She not was. She is a doctor's mother, and both contracted COVID. The 104 year old contracted COVID in hospital. She went into a hospital with a broken hip, as happened at that age. She had surgery, was successful, but on leaving hospital, she picked up COVID, carried it home. She was having a cough, and I must say, her daughter thought that this was it, that she would not live. So we have a situation where I heard from Senator Tom Tavares Finson, who made it very clear that he thought that lady sadly was going to die. And here I'm also saying that 104 years old to survive COVID with home-based treatment is really, really something that we need to pause and to think and to reflect and see how we can apply those strategies to everyone. And what are the common threads? The common thread is early home-based treatment, early home-based monitoring and to have a doctor by your side. Certainly in treating the 104 year old and her 74, 71 year old daughter, I contracted COVID, I treated early and I got over. Home-based monitoring again, pulse oximeter, I cannot say it enough. You can order them on Amazon. Amazon now has a local store in Jamaica and you can get that delivered right to your right to your front door. You can also order glucometers, digital blood pressure machines, and also infrared thermometers. This last, this year and last year really is a period of empowering people that they now are comfortable with pulse oximetry, with infrared temperature scanning, with glucometers, with blood pressure readings. You have to become medically competent with the, with a, with a jargon to become COVID competent. Not necessarily medical school, but just have some basic understanding of what is needed, what is needed in terms of empowering you, empowering you to treat with the condition. Now, you must also have internet connectivity. We have seen our children suffer. We have seen 120,000 children go without any education for two years. That's one third of primary and one third of high school children. That is a um, very serious, serious issue. And that will cause social disorder in years to come. So it's something that has to be treated head on because we can't go a third academic year with one third of our children being left behind, permanently so. As our Honorable Prime Minister told us, permanently damage has already occurred, permanent educational damage. We want to recognize virtual platforms from Dr. Jeremy and Spencer, IDOC, IDOC and others as a way to treat with this condition, virtual, face-to-face -face and blended. When to start treatment? From my perspective, you start treatment once you are symptomatic, once you are symptomatic. If you are asymptomatic with a positive test, you should. there are also things to be done. You should steam and have oral hygiene. We heard from Dr. Hines what bad oral hygiene can do. So we should brush our teeth, floss, brush teeth, and use mouthwash for at least a minute, three times a day. Some people are now at home more, and you know you can lose track of time and not brush your teeth in the midday hour. It's really important to brush your teeth in the morning, in the midday, and in the afternoon. Not just your teeth, your tongue. Very important to get the uh, get that tongue properly scrubbed to reduce your oral oral uh, multiplication of the viruses and bacteria. We know that in a pandemic, it's not just the vir in, in, it's not just a virus that does damage. We're also seeing damage caused by bacteria. So it's very very important that we concentrate on excellent oral hygiene. You cannot do it alone. You must 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 you must have someone with you. Now, most households in Jamaica and across the world will have someone with them. So that is a good thing. Eating smaller quantities, that's important. For me, when I had COVID, I automatically adjusted and eaten less, ate less, I ate less. It's important to eat less because you don't feel your tummy pushing up on your diaphragm as much. And so you're better able to breathe. Now, I was not short of breath, but I was just uncomfortable with my tummy if I should eat much and you get bloated. So it's really important to perhaps look at your portions 
and to come and to adjust. If you're diabetic, if you're adjusting your portions, you need to remember that you also need to adjust your diabetic medication. You, you should try and remain in a localized area of the home so as to avoid cross-contamination or cross-infection with other people in the home. Now, some homes are very small, and it's impossible to, to do that. But in that case, wear your mask, wear your mask, and use a lot of steam. Everybody in the home should be steaming. Lots of juice. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to keep well hydrated, well hydrated. We're in the summer, the really hot summer months. We're coming towards the end, but it's really important, especially in the elderly uh, population, to keep well hydrated. All of us should be well hydrated, and we need to drink at least four liters per day if we are COVID. Yes, you'll be going to the bathroom a lot more, but that's why I recommend that you buy a urinal. It was very helpful for me. It avoided me having to get out of bed every minute, and I adopt, ad adopted hospital-based approaches such as a urinal, because very often the hospital, you can't necessarily have a nurse to help you to the toilet or you're not ambulant. And so a urinal becomes very important. So having a urinal in each home is also a recommendation I think that everybody needs to heed. And in bed, you can watch telly. Remember you're on bed rest. Doctor's orders, you must rest. You must rest. You must rest. Even if you own a business, you work for someone or you work for yourself, you must put that aside and rest. Concentrate on getting better. Deep breathing exercise. Deep breathing, DBEs are very important. And to have somebody to gently cup your chest is very, very important. You need to check your SATs and monitor your pulse. Check your SATs liberally. With that little machine on your fingertip, and here's one on your fingertip, you will see that you can check your SAT regularly through the day, multiple times, Not, nothing lost. You can, cut, you can play with it and keep checking and checking your SAT. And remember your SAT needs to be, your SAT needs to be above 90%. If your SAT is below 90 and does not respond to steaming, go to the hospital. I personally have never had this happen and I will welcome conversations from my other colleagues, but never had this happen. You can actually also step up and give some very potent medication, monoclonal antibodies. And I say to everyone, if you're offered monoclonal antibodies, whether at home or in the hospital, take it. It is very expensive. And I call on government to allow for this drug to be much less expensive by providing subsidies and support to the cost of this drug. This evening, I just got a call seeking some Actemra, which is our local monoclonal antibody for a nurse who is in trouble in Maypen Hospital. She is actually having uh, a, a loss of oxygen. And at the same time, we have one of our very, very senior doctors and senior members of the profession, well-respected, who is actually being treated at home and certainly he's much more comfortable. So why, why is there a difference? Why are we having nurses being lost? We now need to get this information out to everyone. At the end of this meeting, we must be COVID champions and COVID competent. That you can even look to your doctor and say, Doc, you know, I we're so and so. I, I think that we need to see more or we need to try this more. And doctors must be open to trying different approaches so as to improve the results that we're getting locally. So try and send that O2 SAT to patients. Every doctor, every patient must have a doctor's number. They must have a WhatsApp number and mine is their display. This is not the time is saying, I don't want to be bothered. You need to be bothered. You need, because this is a national emergency and every patient that I've treated with, 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 with COVID, it's been free of cost. So there's no charge. It is simple to treat, but you need to get an O2 sat. And there are things that you can do to just steaming, 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 oral hygiene, oral hygiene, oral hygiene. And just doing that alone, you'll be surprised to see what comes out of your mouth and comes out of your lungs. Many people like myself had low O2 sats, 79% in my case, and never for one minute felt short of breath. 
We never recognized that our saturation was so low. And it is, if Dr. Simone Clark is here, she'll agree with me, the term or Dr. McIntosh, they'll agree and they'll tell you, happy hypoxia, that your oxygen is low and you don't feel it. But this makes sense that some people, if you stick them with a pin, they don't feel it. Other people, just the sight of the pin, pin and they're on top of the roof. So it all depends on how we are made. So just with oxygen levels, uh, oxygen levels can be low and yet our alarm does not get triggered. All public spaces, churches, I'm glad the church is well represented in this meeting. All churches, all bars, all cinemas, all public spaces must have a pulse oximeter. And we need the insurance companies, the Sagicor, the Guardians, the Canopy, and the international ones to compensate anyone who is offering healthcare, meaning the doctors or the nurse practitioners, whether it's government or in a private setting, that they compensate for the use of the pulse oximeter so that we can get this as a standard issue in every single practice, that every patient, when they get checked, they're not only, the nurse is not only checking your blood pressure, you're also checking their oxygen saturation. So you're gonna be COVID champions when we're finished here. You're gonna be spreading the message and you're gonna get a different. And we're gonna do one month of strict oral hygiene, floss, brush, Listerine, one month in continuity, as well as we're going to steam. If you don't have COVID, you can steam once a day with 30 minutes with mental crystal. That's what I, that's my preferred choice. Other people may have different choices. And we're going to be able to get better and recover better from this. Now, this is a bit busy, but this is my, <laughs> that's my flow chart. And this is what I comment. This is freely available to my colleagues and any of my colleagues who like this slide, I am happy to share it with you. So what happens if you test positive for COVID or the test is negative, but you are clinically positive? This you must hear. What if you test positive or whether it's antigen test or a PCR test, or you are clinically positive. In that, from that's what I mean, you may not have a positive test, but you obviously uh, have COVID. So you have loss of smell, cough, dry cough, and everybody else in the family had COVID, then it's okay to treat you as clinically positive for COVID. Do not rely on a negative test as comfort. Several people have had multiple days of negative tests and then finally become positive after three, four days. And that's why in the bubble concept for the management of athletes, they undergo regular COVID testing, regular COVID testing. So if someone has a clinical symptom suggesting an acute upper respiratory illness, or if they're having headaches of unusual origin or chest pain, which is definitely a hallmark of COVID or abdominal pain, joint pain, then you should treat as COVID until proven otherwise. And the treatment is everybody can do it, whether you have COVID or not. Steam, steam, steam. Steam three times a day. It's best after eating. Steam with mental crystal, uh, have boiling water, a little mental crystal, and steam three times a day. I think Dr. Lisa, Lisa, uh, Lisa Dawes is here, and I'd like perhaps if she can say how that is going in the government institutions. But hospitals, whether private or government, must employ steaming. Steaming is important. I, when my saturation was 79%, I steamed and it went right up to 99%. It made that huge difference. At no point did I need oxygen. At no point did I ever contemplating needing to go to the hospital. At no point. I felt comfortable and was able from that learning to pass on that experience to other patients which are applied over a hundred times with excellent results. You need to gargle for at least 30 seconds. You can choose your favorite mouthwash, 30, 70 seconds of gargling. Remember after 30 seconds of contact with mouthwash, the virus dies. Now people have been gargling with hydrogen peroxide, some with uh, betadine. Uh, I like to use Listerine the minty one, it makes me feel nicer afterwards and give you that minty feel to your, breast, to your breath. I would recommend that for everyone. The O2 stat, all must steam, all must steam. I believe in the use of ivermectin. I, I have a hunch that a lot of people within the House of Parliament also believe in the use of ivermectin. 
through their own local experience. So ivermectin, my dose, normally 12 milligrams start for adults and then 12 milligrams two days later and then 12 milligrams once a week until you believe you're outside of the exposure zone. Ivermectin is a part of the solution, but not the only solution. As Dr. Leroy Heyman pointed out to us, there is no magic bullet. We must all look at the totality. The key though is to start early treatment and early monitoring and to get in touch with a doctor that you can send those readings to and to provide some comfort or some reassurance. We recently had several, I have about three or four members of the media that we've been able to manage with COVID over the phone. In fact, someone who is also COVID positive, who had been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, still had COVID, had to comfort them and tell them what to do. Vaccination, I recommend, go on record again, we have said it before, I'll say it again, we recommend the vaccination. There's not enough evidence at this time, however, to make it mandatory. So vaccinations alone will not be the answer. It will help to reduce hospitalization and death, but we need to focus on what can be done early. What can we do early to help people, to help people at home and to avoid hospitalization and treatment? We saw where Minister Tufton sent pictures of hospitals, of patients in hospitals, which was quite shocking, actually. Really shocking to see those pictures. But what it really just drove home to me is the importance of early home-based treatment to avoid the need to go to the hospital. And remember, some patients will get COVID because hospitals have now become epicenters of COVID. Because they've had so many COVID cases coming into them, they have now become contaminated by COVID. So if you go in and you don't have COVID, there's a, there's a chance you will leave with COVID. If your saturation is below 85% and it does not respond to steaming for 30 minutes, you must time how long you steam. It must be for 30 minutes, for 30 minutes. With mental crystal, put a, put a cloth over your head and over a bucket. Be careful not to burn yourself. You can put a bucket within a bucket so that if there's a spill, it will spill into the outer bucket and put that over your head. And with that, you then, you are able to um, see an improvement in saturation. I'm yet to meet a single patient whose oxygen saturation has not improved once they steamed. It, it is so powerful and potent, and it's perhaps even more potent than than, than inhalers, which have not been found to be very effective in improving oxygenation in COVID. And the reason why I believe that the oxygen, the steaming is so good is that it actually is killing and denaturing the viral particles. So when you steam with hot, mentholated, uh, moist air, you, uh, uh, and moist, you know, with water uh, saturated air, then that will actually denature the viral particles. So sometimes also you're having problems with a, with a positive COVID test and you steam, you see that COVID tests become negative, especially in people who have had COVID some a couple of months before, they still shed non-infectious dead viral particles. And just by steaming, that can clear up those viral particles and give you the negative COVID test so you can catch your flight. Temperatures above 99 degrees, we always give Panadol. In my experience, I only had temperature of 101 degrees for a single day, for one day. So the temperature is not long lasting unless it becomes secondary bacterial infection. But in any event, the reason for the successful application of this treatment is because we're treating early. Antibiotics is a must. I use Zithromax or Levofloxacin uh, macrolide with Zinat, um, which is 500 BD. These are readily available. That, those are the two combinations that I use, especially in diabetics. I tend not to just use one antibiotic. As a neurosurgeon, we are very cautious. We don't want a single infection anywhere. A single infection in the brain can permanently damage someone. So I'm always aggressive with my antibiotics. People must also pause and remember that 100 years ago, when we had the Spanish flu, what killed people was not the influenza, it was not the virus, that the coronavirus, no, that's not what killed people. What killed people was a secondary bacterial infection. A lot of people with COVID get secondary bacterial infections and it's a bacterial infection that kill you and cause that 50 million death toll 100 years ago. Antibiotics were only invented 
1928, or only discovered in 1928 by um, Alexander Fleming surreptitiously and, and uh, serendipitously, sorry, my, my apologies, serendipitously. He only uh, discovered this by accident. And it was only until 1941, after 13 years of study, they were finally able to present penicillin to the world. And penicillin is one of the greatest discoveries in humankind. So you better believe it, that this infection needs antibiotics. Or if you're gonna hold off on antibiotics, you've been needing to monitor in that patient at least twice for the day and pick up when they get this cough rattling on the chest or if they go on to have low oxygen saturations. You must, any sat below 94%, in my view, you have to start them on steroids. I got four milligrams dexamethasone for myself and treated with others, treated a 104 year old and her, her daughter and immediately we improved, remained solid and we have come through just that after a week, after stopping the steroids, you get you feel a little weak because you get what's called steroid withdrawal. That's totally normal. You have to look out for it so that in case you faint, you don't fall, you don't fall and hurt yourself. You have to always have something nearby to hold on to. Sats below 95%, you must, must, must also be on blood thinners. My favorite blood thinner is Zeralto. Above 95%, you can use aspirin. Below 95, at 95 or below, we're looking at Zarelto, 50 milligrams start, and then 10 milligrams daily for at least three weeks, at least three weeks. We take note, there are several patients who upon the day of leaving hospital are perfectly well, and then suddenly you hear that an event happened, they just suddenly collapsed and died. And most of the times it's either a heart attack or a show a blockage of a blood vessel. And that perhaps relates to the fact that they need stronger blood thinners. So it's something that needs to be looked at, strong blood thinners. Pregnant women, a little bit of a challenge. So we, and Dr. Matthew Taylor will tell you that we need to get them on plexine. Dr. Matthew Taylor, like myself, someone also who overcame, who, over, who had got COVID and successfully treated it at home. Supplements. Uh, can be used and we recommend supplements. We must not shun the sun. Dr. Heyman showed you the therapeutic effect of the sun. A lot of civilizations, a lot of religious civilizations in the past and even in the present rotated, uh, uh, evolved around worship in the sun. We're not going back there. And mankind no longer worships the sun, but worships the sun. Stop working, worshiping the S-U-N and now worship the S-O-N but we must not shun the S-U-N. We, we need sunshine. We have a lot of it in Jamaica, and I hope one day that Jamaica's contribution to the world will reflect that our sunshine make, makes our COVID burden five times less than what is in the UK. The COVID death rate per 100,000 in Jamaica is 40 per 100,000. The COVID death rate in the UK is 200 per 100,000, multiple times higher. But supplements are important, especially in countries where there's a lack of sunshine and it's dark. So we need to look at the vitamin D, 5,000 units, vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams, vitamin E, 1,000 international units, zinc, 50 milligrams, caltrate D, 600 milligrams. Get 30 minutes of sun bath in the morning and in the evening. Home physio is now available for COVID patients. And you, I've given you my contact. You can certainly reference me and I'll be able to give you a litany of physiotherapists who are now able to take on COVID full on board and treat you at your home. Early home-based treatment is very, very important. This is our honest and fervent belief. It's effective. In my patient, every single one lived 100%. It is cheaper. It's more convenient. It's more comfortable, family-friendly, privacy, dignity. I can go on. No need to. Everybody knows that if you had a choice between treated at home and treated in a hostel, by and large, the answer overwhelmingly is to treat me at home. Therefore, we must balance this conversation. There are winners and losers who have lost. 120,000 children in Jamaica have been permanently educationally damaged. Some irrecoverable, irrecoverable. They have lost. And in so much that the children have lost, Jamaica's future has been tarnished. It has been hampered. And we would probably have to go back to before to the 1800s 
to see this sort of parallel in terms of the exclusion, the abandonment of education for a lot of children. Moderation needs to be there for the order of the day. We cannot be just locked down, locked down, locked down and have so many children, so many children harmed. We need to bring them into the conversation and have them educated. We need to have less totalitarian rhetoric. When someone says, well, we must never waste a crisis, believe you me, that's the utterance of a totalitarian dictat. We cannot dictate in a situation like this. We must have inclusiveness, not egg division. We must also have things like very expensive monoclonal antibodies. If you are given monoclonal antibodies from my personal use and application, I can 100% advocate for it. The problem is very, very expensive. I get that. We know it's, and that's why we appeal to government to see what subsidies can be applied to monoclonal antibodies. Again, just this evening, I got a call from a nurse in Maypen to supply monoclonal antibodies. Unfortunately, my stock was down. So we need, I'm making a special appeal to anyone in this room who has monoclonal antibodies at Temera, MAP, a nurse at Maypen Hospital desperately needs some. Home-based treatment is extremely effective. Home-based treatment is the way to go. Home-based treatment is what majority in the world want. We therefore then must become COVID competent and COVID champions. What's the word? COVID competent and COVID champions. You know someone who has COVID, you know someone who was suspected to have COVID, steam, steam, steam. Brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your tongue, brush your tongue as well. You're gonna be flossing before you do all of that. And you're going to also do mouthwash. And you're gonna do that three times for the day. After every meal, after every food that goes in your stomach, into your mouth, you're gonna do oral hygiene, oral hygiene, oral hygiene. And I'm calling as of the 21st of August this year, we are calling for the government to join with us and announce a one month period of oral, strict or oral hygiene, promoting oral hygiene and to promote COVID champions and COVID competence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hunter. We have Dr. Duval online now. Dr. Duval is the first physician that I know in Jamaica to have called for the use and used ivermectin. He's used it from as for many years on his dogs. And from April 2020, having gone to India before and also contacted Nigeria. Hi, Chris. Yes. So thank you. So enter into the discussion, sir. Well, my story is simply, you know, I, um, when we didn't have any vaccines or any cures, uh, they started speaking about uh, hydrochloroquine. I had been to India, I had taken it. I was not afraid of it and we got some together and we shared that. But by April, they, they, they were looking for new, um, of 2020, looking for, for, for a new agent. Everybody was talking about the possibility of vaccines coming. Anyway, that, that was not available. That was not possible. And, it was, and we were looking for anything that had hope. We investigated it. The, 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 um, in, in April, I was still taking, I was still um, convinced about the hydrochloroquine, but by June, there came out a, a, a paper from Bangladesh um, talking about the, the, the possibility of using ivermectin. Before that, somebody had uh, publicized it that in vitro, ivermectin was capable of stopping the COVID virus. I had friends who I had made in India and friends from Nigeria who we discussed protocols. And when the name ivermectin came up, I recognized it immediately because I gave it to my dogs every month. I went to the pharmacist, they didn't have any access. And I remember that we got the IV, intravenous ivermectin from the veterinarians to treat um, overwhelming um, maggot invest infestation. So that was available. But the oral one, um, we, we continue the, the investigation um, amassing 
uh, all the, the data that came out, you know, small trials, large trials, and we, we um, got a, a pharmacist friend who sent, got some abroad, and we were able to say, well, all my fellow consultants, we put aside one dose of, uh, to start with. In those days, it was day one, day three, and then weekly if you got it. So nobody used it prophylactically at that time. It is this year now, um, February 2021, when it became so much more available, so much easier that everybody decided that it, it, it is possible for some people in high risk situations to use it prophylactically as well. You know, the, I noticed that um, Dr. Manning from the Medical Association of Jamaica and uh, a lot of other doctors have been calling for it. Uh, Dr. Rice um, had meetings with the government and we thought that this thing was going to take off. We ourselves, we I don't have the opportunity to treat a lot of patients like the private practitioners, but um, you know, in sharing with my colleagues and with anyone who asked of an opinion on it, I could give them the, 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 the analysis that has been in, in, um, in the public space. It's freely available and they'll make their own decisions. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Chris. This is really important. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I am aware, you're the first physician first member of our community locally to have called for the use of ivermectin. And I want to salute you for that. And I'm kind of reliably informed also that the majority members of the House of Parliament also are calling for the use of ivermectin. And I don't know if Senator Tom Tavares Finson is still with us, but I, I'm pretty sure that he's also strongly in favor of ivermectin. So I think that we need to speak with a collective voice through our local representatives, through our members of parliament, to have it discussed and to have that drug available. It's been, it's been safe, we know it's safe. It's been around for 40 years. It's safer than hydroxychloroquine. And I've used hydroxychloroquine. It, it's safe, but it's also, it works. That people who have been on ivermectin, their chance of severe outcomes, death and severe hospitalization is, is, is next to, is practically very, it's very, very low. But early home-based treatment strategies are important but we need to get the government on board in mandating that ivermectin is now available in all government hospitals and not the privileged who are able to access it independently through the private pharmacies. You know, again, we recommend the use of ivermectin. We recommend the use of vaccines like ivermectin. They're relatively safe. Ivermectin is much safer than vaccines. It has a much safer profile than vaccines and vaccines are relatively safe. We certainly don't recommend that either should be mandated, but it should be available as an option for people to use. So we certainly want to commend to our, our audience that ivermectin needs to be available to everyone. And however, we must avoid totalitarian dictatorial language which infringes upon the human rights, but also focus on things such as getting our children back into education, because crime and violence is a still, still a larger public health problem than COVID, and COVID is a problem. I think this will be, you will, um, if you want to hear continued guidance, we will be tweeting more and more as we try to guide the public through the with respect to the early home-based treatment of COVID. And my handle is Dr. Roger Hunter, at Dr. Roger Hunter. And it will, it's been displayed earlier. I asked Lorna to display it again. So um, I'll ask Dr. Heyman, if you'd come in at this point and give us some comments. And we're just about to start our question and answer section because I don't think we'll have any more presenters. The audience has been very, very good. We have gone a lot. Okay, Brown, are you hearing? Please unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I'm hearing you now. Welcome. Just introduce yourself, please, so that everybody can hear where you're from 
Tell, share your experience. This is about shared learning. All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm from Jamaica. I'm a GP. Um, I don't have as extensive experience as Dr. Hunter and the other presenters. Um, I'm asking this question. Um, some persons have been on hydrochloroquine for a while as prevention, and some are now asking if ivermectin can be taken as prevention, not meaning that you're taking it in the first day of COVID, but as a, let's say, as a doctor, is it advisable for anybody to take ivermectin every single day until this pandemic eases off? And no, no, so, no. what should the dose be? Thank you for that question. You're a doctor? I didn't get that. Yes, point. I'm, that's why I'm asking. Yes. You're, you're, a, you're a, what, um, a primary care, private, or? Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't hear my introduction. I am a GP, private right. GP in Jamaica. Where in Jamaica? I am staying yeah. in Kingston. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I will leave it like that. Um, okay. Yes. And I'm asking on behalf of other doctors if ivermectin mm -hmm. is going to be taken as prevention. Can it be taken as real prevention where you take it like how some persons have been taking hydrochloroquine for the 15 months to prevent right. so, even getting it? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can take it as preventing serious illness. You can't stop a viral particle from landing inside your nose. It's a physical process. Correct. Uh -huh. But you can mm -hmm. stop that virus from setting up an inflammatory response inside your body. So you can prevent yourself being symptomatic or severely symptomatic. So ivermectin is absolutely not to be taken every day in prevention. It just needs to be taken once a week, once a week, 12 milligrams, once a week. Easy to remember, 12 milligrams stack, 12 milligrams two days later, and 12 milligrams once a week going forward. Okay, and so a doctor who just wants to take it as prevention should not really take it then. That's really for treatment. No, it's also for prevention at 12 milligrams once oh, a week. So I you were you. exposed okay. to 10 patients who mm -hmm. had COVID, you had a very unusual day, then you can mm -hmm. take at 12 milligrams, at 12 milligrams once per week. Okay, got you. Once per week. Mm -hmm. Um, Angela, can we, can we get your question? Angela, Angela Campbell, can you unmute yourself, Angela? Good night. I am a retired nurse. I was exposed to COVID-19 and I was advised by a nurse from Canada that I could use hydrogen peroxide for nebulization as how you would use the Ventolin with the saline. I did that because I was having chest tightness, short of breath, and it worked. Also, I had sore throat. It worked very well. And I could feel the difference in my lungs, in my throat, in my nose. So I don't know if that is being used out here in um, work as a home prophylaxis or treatment. Angela, thank you very much for sharing that experience. It certainly goes into the whole library of local shared learning through your friends in Canada, and we thank them for that. Yes, uh, we have uh, situations yes, where people have used um, use hydrogen peroxide. I think Dr. Hines presented earlier, they have used hydrogen peroxide to, to, to gargle in part of the part of the oral hygiene. I'm not sure it's seen where they necessarily have used it in terms of nebulizing it, but it's something that is worthwhile bearing in mind. As a neurosurgeon, I, I use hydrogen peroxide on the brain to stop bleeding in a diluted portion or in the spinal cord. So it stands to reason that it would probably be relatively safe being used along the line of our, of our um, respiratory tree. So we certainly will bear that in mind and it remains one another addition to the armament. So thank you, thank you for that contribution, Angela. Licia, can we have your uh, question? Licia? Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. And thank you. Thank you so much for this initiative. I really applaud the medical fraternity for this kind of initiative. 
and um, we're looking forward to having better results from all this, this pandemic. The question, I've, I've, I've seen this question going in the chat and I've not seen a response, hence I'm asking. There are many people who would have wanted to, to listen in, but for one reason or another, they are not able to. Is this recording going to be available? When and where can we get it? Okay, I'm gonna to try to publish it on YouTube tomorrow. Oh, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. There is a recording. There's an early recording on YouTube from the press conference last week. I would also commend it to you. It's early, community-based, early home and community-based treatment of COVID, the Jamaican experience. If you Google that, you should see it coming up. If you okay. also uh, take my number, 361, and just say, you're the lady who asked a question, then I can share that link with you directly by WhatsApp. And the number okay. that I gave, the 361, 361 2686, that's the WhatsApp number that we can interact with patients uh, in okay. terms of um, sharing that information. So you can also get it through that. 361 2686. Okay, WhatsApp number. Mm. Thank you, okay. Doug. Appreciate it. Have Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. This is a national response. Our colleagues up and down okay. the length of Jamaica are answering the call. They're no okay. longer afraid of COVID. They're getting COVID like myself and treating COVID directly. So and, and I want to salute. Because I'm an, I'm an educator and we all want to go back to school. So I want just... every educator, and I hope the JTA is listening. I gather that they were invited to this meeting. My Part of my manifesto plan as president-elect nominee is to make sure every single teacher in Jamaica has the contact number of a doctor. Every Jamaican teacher must have a contact number for a doctor. If we can treat ourselves early and live, why can't we treat a teacher early and live? And why are our nurses dying? What's happening? We need to get the message right. Every life is important a doctor, a nurse, and non-medical people. So we are determined to get that 100% outcome that we know we should be getting in this climate. We never will have snow on Jamaica's, in Jamaica's environment. It is much different if you're in a country where it's minus 40, minus 30 degrees outside. We do not have that problem. So we need to get our teachers in a level of safety with a package of early home-based treatment so that in case they're exposed at school and they develop symptoms, we can get them back, get awesome. them treated early and back to school. Awesome. Excellent. God bless you all for this very timely presentation. You're welcome. Please spread the word. I'm trying to get Dr. Heyman to, to contribute. Doctor, um, I'm not sure why they can't unmute themselves. But Dr. James, are you, are you able to unmute yourself? We're going to go up right until midnight tonight if I have to. I'm not going anywhere. This is about making COVID champions and making COVID competence. And we'll stay as long, on, as, long as possible to the last question is answered and everybody is comfortable. And we're doing this as a shared experience based on our personal outcomes and also based on the outcomes of our colleagues. Alvin Bailey, hello. Can you unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? My name is Alvin Bailey. I'm, I'm a bishop in the Holiness Christian Church, one of the spiritual leaders in this country. Um, I've heard the comments. You. I've heard the comments on the St. Joseph Hospital. I've heard the comments on the contracts for doctors, six months contract, and other comments that seem to point to the inadequacy in our medical, national medical system. I'm wondering if the, if, if the Medical Association of Jamaica or some other council in Jamaica could not put together a model of medical care in Jamaica that the government could adopt so that we can run the country better from a medical standpoint. That is my first question. If a group of persons could not put a proposal for an adequate, efficient medical system in Jamaica for them to adopt. And my second question is, I've heard many promotions on vaccinations, and I believe in vaccination, I'm fully vaccinated and I promote vaccination. But I'm wondering if there couldn't be equal promotion of other ivermectin, for example, and the access making the nation have access to it so that we can save lives. 
I'm wondering why we're not hearing about treatment and about the, the one, two, three of home care as a public announcement that can save lives. I'm wondering if there's anything that you can do or this council can do to put it to the private sector who I think is online tonight, that in, in, in addition to their initiative to promote vaccine, they can promote an initiative to promote ivermectin, make it available and make the one, two, three of home care available that people can save lives. Bishop Bailey, thank you so much for that question. I'm desperately trying to get my colleagues back on line here in terms of treating with that question. What is for sure, though, every doctor that practices in Jamaica, regardless of their point of origin, will resonate with what you've just said. They will resonate with the experience that as a non-doctor treating with the health system in Jamaica, you recognize there's a dichotomy between private care and socialized government care. We want all care to be equal. We want all care to be accessible. We want equitable care for those with the least can still get decent care. And those with the most can help to contribute to the funding of healthcare. We have made a number of recommendations. And in this particular meeting, the focus is on early home-based treatment. It's really a call for the government to reconfigure their services. If the independent private sector, private public health providers, the private practitioners can reconfigure their services to go back to how we were and to deliver care directly in patients' homes rather than in our offices, we invite the government to follow suit, to listen to our example, and to come along as we reimagine a more efficient healthcare, a more dignified healthcare, one that is cheaper, one that is quicker to access, and one that is comfortable right in your home. And telemedicine is one particular tool of achieving that. And WhatsApp is the simplest telemedicine platform that you can ever imagine. For me personally, I've just taken a decision not to charge for COVID treatment, but we understand that there may be some reasonable charges applied. But we want means testing, but we want a repositioning of healthcare back closer to home. And with that in mind, for instance, I would not envision that the government would rebuild Cornwall Regional to its original size. And of course, recommendations have been made for them to destroy Cornwall Regional, blow it up, and to build something half the size. Because we know with technology, a lot of the treatment can be delivered in your home. You don't have to be in a hospital. And COVID is the best condition to treat in inside your, inside actually in your home, but you must treat it early. And to treat it early, you need a pulse oximeter to measure your oxygen. Is there something that maybe you'd like your to say? Question. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you'd like to say to me with the government representatives who are here tonight that could help this nation to better treat this business of COVID-19 and the upsurge that we are now experiencing. Could you tell them or ask for a meeting with the Minister of Minister and, our, and his people of health and put something on the table for them to implement? Because I'm really kind of getting to the top of the many talks and useful talks and fruitful talks and necessary talks, but no action from the people without in authority. And I'm wondering if they being online tonight could see to, could meet with you gentlemen and ladies and in fact de de develop a policy of advertisement, a policy of promotion that would help people in addition to vaccination to secure their lives. Would they be prepared tonight to say meet with us tomorrow morning or, or, or Friday morning and get something off the, of the, of, get something going? We have tried a particular approach for a particular one year and a half of lockdown, lockdown, and take the injection, but we are saying tonight what has been what has been said already that early treatment works, early home based treatment works, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the same medication that we're giving or the same strategy. We'd like everybody to steam, and we'd like everybody, everyone, to have in you know strict oral hygiene, floss, brush, Listerine. And then from there, we can talk about ivermectin, we can talk about antibiotics, steroids, if the need arises. But a lot of people simply with steaming alone, I would say 95% of patients, 
they feel improvements right away. So yes, Thank we you. join with your call and join with your question to say that we have offered ourselves, we made a recommendation for pulse oximetry, for instance, from March last year, and there was a lukewarm response. We made recommendation for other, a lot of other things, open the windows, close, open the windows, turn off the AC. But now we're seeing that maybe there is some will to come back to a point of discussion and to make ivermectin readily available. So I thank you for that question, and I'm sure the powers that I've heard. Can you unmute, Andre? Yes. Um, I, 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 I work in the, the call center industry in Montego Bay, and there has been um, breakouts. So this is something that concerns me. Um, I have asked this question of the, the Minister of Health on Facebook, but I did not see a response. So I'm asking it here. I'm aware that um, in, in, in the past, when there, there was a, the, the outbreak of SARS and MERS, that they had been testing of um, vaccines, mRNA vaccines to be specific. And um, my question is, what long-term effects do these mRNA vaccines have? What I, I have tried searching on the World Health Organization and CDC websites, among others, and I'm not seeing anything about the long-term effects of these new kinds of vaccines. These have not been vaccines that we are aware of with long-term testing. So um, what are what's the long-term effects of these vaccines? Okay, um, thanks for that question, Andre. Last year, last week, we did a lot on, on the vaccines and we did a, also, uh, we made some statements. Unfortunately, this is not a, a conference that's gonna be focused on the vaccine. It's focused on early home-based treatments. I think it is clear that mRNA technology is new. It's been set up very clear. And there are also disclaimers in terms of not being uh, eligible to, you know, not being open to lawsuits. The technology has been in, in the making for about 13, 14, 15 years, but it's not like the flu vaccine that has been around from the 1930s or the polio vaccine. So there are elements of uncertainty, but you have to balance uncertainty with benefit, what the known benefit through acute study. So I think it needs to be balanced, the conversation, and we have to have a meeting together of the minds in terms of how to best to treat it. But again, I don't want to say much further on the vaccine because this conference today is about early home-based treatment for COVID and what you can do to become a COVID champion, COVID competent. Steamy, brush, floss, blistering, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your tongue, brush your teeth, brush your tongue. That is the message you should take strongly. We are treating with this message. We are treating 100%. We're getting 100% results. Treating patients with early home-based treatment using pulse oximetry, we're getting 100% results and nobody is on oxygen nobody's going into hospital you need to hear that you need to understand that within that now if we can apply that across jamaica and see a reduction in our numbers then we can start to to take a, whole, a, a more comprehensive look of all the strategies so thanks again andre for that you get patricia patricia headley can you unmute good afternoon doctor good afternoon Patricia Headley, guidance counselor at the primary school in Montego Bay. Oh, thank you. Good to have you. Good to hear from you. Thank you. And, and really appreciate what you have been doing. Uh, it's well needed. I, my question is, can we get ivermectin over the, like an over-the-counter uh, medication wherever it's available? I think in Jamaica, it's usually with the assent of a doctor, but I think it, it existed in this very weird zone where there is no government determination that they were granted permission to be used forever. So if there is no government, it's, it's kind of a no-no, but in terms of it is being used. And I think, you know, for the sake of the pandemic that it can be available to members of the public, but remember though, that you really need a doctor to guide you about dosing and intervals and monitoring. So it's not something I would recommend to do it, to go it alone. You really need to get a doctor's number, a doctor who is comfortable treating you. Perhaps again, I, I've offered my number, Dr. Leroy Heyman, he's also available. I'm happy to refer you to him or Dr. Michael James or any other doctor, much far more senior, far more comfortable than me, far more confident, competent than I. 
and I can certainly point you in their direction. But the aim is for that we want all doctors here tonight to feel comfortable with our shared experience and to apply to their practice and to treat COVID. Right now, every other patient walking into a doctor's office is COVID positive. Ivermectin is a part of the answer. It is not the only answer, just like the vaccine. So I've had patients with just steaming alone, they have gotten better without the need of ivermectin and without the need for more, you know, more, more expensive pathways. So I thank you for that question, Patricia, and I hope this resonates with you. So we're gonna move again. I'm gonna uh, allow Michelle to ask the next question. Hi, good evening. Um, Michelle, pharmacist in Montego Bay. Um, Could you answer the ivermectin question? From, from Patricia? Yeah, it's as you said, it's kind of tricky. Um, okay. I don't know of it know. being on a list. I mean, it's used for veterinary purposes. Right. And so it's kind of categorized there. Um, but it, it is a, we do have some pockets of it being available here. Um, and the prices, I see people asking about pricing and all that. And, um, the price has gotten kind of ridiculous, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of wanted to stay within the framework of what you're saying. There's a, someone who had mentioned earlier that um, they use hydrogen peroxide. And so I was kind of interested in finding out if there was a strength or a grade, because what we have here is three and six percent. There is a food grade hydrogen peroxide, which we don't get here, which is like a 35 percent, which like in the 1920s was being used to treat cancer. And if you know of like ozone therapy, you know, that's where that all came out of. And so it'd be interesting to know, um, since she heard from a nurse in the States, you know, what grade would be used here? Because we gargle with peroxide here, we dilute peroxide and gargle with it here. We use it on cuts. I mean, peroxide is a, a, a household product, but it would be interesting to know because that's something we could source and have it available as a home remedy here as well. Um, another point you mentioned um, 12 milligram ivermectin. Um, I know the FLCCC uses once daily dosing for six to seven days if you have COVID. And as you said, day one, day three, then once weekly if you're taking it prophylactically. And so what is your take on like the body weight? Like, because there are patients who 140 pounds, then there are patients who are 240 pounds. I don't imagine a 240 pound patient taking one 12 milligram tablet. And so what is your take on that? Because I recommend or I suggest um, the, based on the FLCCC's um, recommendation or guidance, uh, 0 0.2 milligram per kilogram body weight. So just wanted to get your take on that doc. I think the nurse should, okay, thanks for that, uh, that, that shared comment and, and question. The nurse mentioned um, it was 3% hydrogen peroxide that she had used. In terms of the ivermectin, I normally would be comfortable going up to 15, 12 to 15 milligrams start and, and 48 hours later and then weekly intervals. But from my perspective, it's, a part of the arsenal. It's not a magic bullet. Ivermectin on its own will not get you there in all the time. It needs to be combined with early strategies, early home-based strategies, including steaming with mental crystals, including O2 monitoring with the pulse oximetry, including antibiotics. We said double antibiotics. We also say, um, dexamethasone steroids and, and blood thinners. So it's a, it's a combination of strategies. I've seen people just with steaming alone with their sats in the 80s, they steamed, control their sugar, and they're fine. So sometimes steaming alone is enough. It's enough to get you where you want. So I think I'm not going to make a huge deal if it should be 12 milligrams, 15 or 20 milligrams. All I know, it's been around for 40 years and ivermectin has been proven to be safe. It's a class B drug in pregnancy, which means it can be used. And so, you know, I think it's, um, 
it's a part of the answer, but not the magic bullet. I hope that's okay. Can we get a question from Cynthia? Oh, from Mark, sorry. Mark, can you Mark, can you unmute yourself? All right. So Mark Ramsey, I'm an attorney based in Kingston. Thank you. Welcome. All right. So, well, first of all, thank you for the series of seminars. I think they've been very useful and helpful. I've been following um, the issue of early treatment as part of a response to a pandemic. And like some of the other persons commenting, I've found it unfortunate that there has been no emphasis, no real emphasis placed on early treatments. Um, I have two questions. The first one is whether the Minister of Health has put out uh, a treatment protocol on, for outpatient treatments. Is, that, is there an official? I know that they have been providing guidance, I guess, in the hospital setting, but have they provided any sort of official guidance to, to doctors on outpatient treatments for, for COVID? Mark, uh, I'll take it one at a time in case you had two questions. I'll say one at a time. Uh, for my first sure. response is this. Um, we did invite the Minister of Health to be here. So just to be sure, if, if the Minister of Health or his representative, if anyone is here from the ministry, I just invite you to take that question on or put your hands up or just unmute yourself and to speak to that question. I'll just, I'll give a period of 10 seconds to respond. Is there anybody from the Ministry of Health or any authority, proper, proper authority, who can speak to that from regarding treatment protocols? Because I'm not with the Ministry of Health at all. I'm on the- Yeah, I, I haven't found I any pathway. doctor that, I haven't found any doctor that is aware of a outpatient um, treatment protocol for COVID, which, which is very concerning to me because um, I, I don't think most, I don't think many cases start in the hospital. There are many cases start out of the hospital and people will go to their physician. And so some guidance would be useful. So thank you for, for making this information available. Um, the, the second question really relates to um, a sort of you know, distribution strategy for, for these medications. I mean, you mentioned there are others that are important that are non-prescription as well. Um, are there any, do you know of any thoughts on that from the private sector or anywhere that's pushing to get these items readily available all around? I think definitely the major distributors are lobbying a lot of Paramed, Lasco, others, you know, FACI, Tigers Grant. They definitely are lobbying. Of course, they would love to have this medication in the island, but they have some restrictions. And that's why we have to join with and become COVID champions to get our politicians or members of parliament. They're working hard, a lot of things they have to do, but this is a pandemic and we require them to focus, focus. Let ivermectin be available. Take the duty prices of things like this, the pulse oximeter, so that we can see the cost between the three and the 4,000 range. We want to facilitate other things, not just the pulse oximeter. We want to facilitate the glucometer, anything that's used in the management of COVID and to incentivize doctors in a way, for instance, 20% duty concession for doctors in a private pathway that will see the doctor now, instead of carrying you into their office, they will go to your home where for instance, five, 10 people have become infected. They will visit you and will virtually or in person and treat you at that level. So we wanna see policies taken up by government and we want, we want to see them applied in that regard. I hope I have treated with your question adequately. Um, Cynthia, can we get your question in as well, Cynthia? Oh, hi, this is Cynthia. Um, not in Jamaica at the moment, I'm in USA. Okay, Someone Marty. gave me the link and I'm in, I really enjoy the the um, information. Welcome. And my question was about the same Just thing. That the, your medical background, your teaching, we're really interested. No, 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 no medical background. Okay, okay, go ahead. Um, just ask, um, the question I was about to ask was asked about the, what type of hydrogen peroxide. Cheapest. So that was answered. Um, and I was just wondering for the people who live in, what would you recommend for the people who live in like 
rural oh. Jamaica, really oh. rural Jamaica, that they, what could they just readily get in that, in their area for a home treatment? Thanks for that question. Again, I was at pain to point out early intervention as key. It kind of doesn't really matter what, but the most important thing I think is once you get early intervention and start steaming, steaming, everybody can steam. Steam with mental crystal readily available. It volatile, it evaporates, becomes volatile and gets into your nose. Steaming gets to places nothing else can get to. So steaming is the main thing I would recommend to the rural communities or even inner city communities. It's cheap, readily available and can do it. And also in a hospital, no hospital, no government hospital is steaming by and large. This is maybe the occasional hospital. And we commend to our brothers in government and our sisters in government that they now implement steaming much more frequently because steaming can avoid the use of uh, oxygenation and deterioration. Just today, we just had a patient that just announced somebody from St. Thomas was intubated, put on the ventilator, transferred to KPH, put on dialysis, and then he died today. Once you reach a ventilator in Jamaica, that's a 100% death rate. So steaming is the recommendation to everybody up and down, not just in Jamaica, outside of Jamaica, every nook and cranny of Jamaica, steam, 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 brush teeth, floss, brush your tongue, brush your tongue, Listerine after every meal oral hygiene, and that alone is the first strategy. A pulse oximeter for every home is another strategy. This must be in every home free of duty. You must have a doctor's number. I provided my number. You must have a doctor's number. That alone will provide comfort and guidance and competence in empowering you to overcome this. Okay, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Jacqueline Hill, are you still there? Can you unmute? Jackie? Hi, good night. Good night. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Hill, and I'm a teacher. Oh, nice. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. My you question is, can persons with underlying illnesses or, um, well, health issues, can they use these remedies that you're talking about? I heard you speaking of ivermectin as a prophylactic treatment. Can Mm -hmm. Persons yeah. with underlying illnesses use these medications. Very safe drug, extreme, got a Nobel Prize. Yes, they can use ivermectin. Not only that, but remember, this is not about this is not ivermectin conference. This is a conference yes. very home-based treatment to start right, with. Right. You need this little thing, a pulse. Yes. Also, you can stay wherever you are. Order it on Amazon. You need internet connectivity and it comes to your home. Amazon is in Jamaica. It should cost you about 20, 25 US dollars. You can also okay. go to the pharmacy, Jamaica Hospital and Supplies, he get his grant, Mega Mart, a number of pharmacies, Monarch, Fontana, they, they are selling it. More and more people are selling it, selling it. I said it to the government last year. I recommended it strongly. No yes. response. No response. I said it. I went on their Zoom meeting. So, well, Dr. Hunter, these Zoom meetings are for general practitioners. Say, no, everybody, all hands on deck. We, it, you shouldn't distinguish between a right, a, right. General, no, it's all hands on deck. You're I'm a psychiatrist. I should know how to treat COVID. You have right. to be competent. So, uh, yes, the ivermectin is safe with underlying the um, the steaming menthol. I have been using the menthol crystals. Safe with underlying. Yes. Steam. If you don't have the disease, you should probably just steam twice a, twice a day. If yes. you have it, you should steam anywhere from three to five times a day, at least 30 minutes interval. It's a very strong, it hits it hits you very strong. Yes, 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 it does. And if you have to get a negative COVID test and you still have some viral particles left over yes. from before you steam and the particle disintegrates and you get a, part, you get a negative test. Okay, thank yes, you. Thank you, Dr. Thank, back in thank September. you. We thank you for what you're doing. You you have our future. The yes, future yes. Your hand. <laughs> and I join with you as president-elect nominee. I will be more than willing to make sure that every Jamaican teacher has yes. a doctor's number.
So, and we are very grateful for that. I actually mm -hmm. teach special education students. Oh my gosh, so, you're rare. You're right. rare. <laughs> We're here. Yeah. Hard to treat special ed. I think I saw Miss Christine Rodriguez chipping in. She was the head of the, uh, I think, the Disabilities Foundation of Jamaica. Yes. We want to recognize the great work you do. It takes a special person to be able to educate, especially a special child. It requires a high level of, of professionalism. And whatever we can do, support you in getting close to your children because social distance is a concept. It's very it's difficult, very difficult. Theoretical concept. And so we want to treat it. Of course, we recommend the vaccine, but yes. we, we can't mandate the vaccine. Other evidence has to emerge for you to get to that. So but we recommend the vaccine and we don't, we, we say not, not, not to mandate it at this time. Okay, okay. thank you, doctor. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Andrea Drew. Can we get you to unmute yourself, Andrea Jew? Hi, good night. It's Andrew, actually. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, all right. So my name is Andrew Dixon. I am a music teacher at um, a primary school in Kingston. Um, I wear more than one hat. So I'm also a life insurance agent. Um, I, have, I was introduced to this um, session and I must say it's very informative. I've been taking notes. Um, I have parents who are over 60, so I'm studying for myself and them. <laughs> um, I heard you mention hydroxychloroquine as well as ivermectin, but I was asking in the chat, is hydroxychloroquine available in Jamaica? Oh, yes, um, 100%. I use it. Better available. Okay. pharmacist has it. No impediments. Okay. Right, because I was told that it may be a bit more affordable than some of the other types. Yeah, definitely. You don't have to use hydroxy. You don't have to use ivermectin. We recommend it. You don't have to use them. But early home-based treatment, recognizing early, steaming brush floss, listerine early, using your SAT, deep breathing exercise. If your SAT remains above 95% and holds, there's no need to escalate to further treatment. Just keep monitoring your SAT three, four, five, six, seven times as many times for the day as possible. If your SAT is now dripping, dropping, say, below 95%, 90 to 95%, then you need to now add antibiotics and blood thinners. But you can do a, a, a monitoring-based protocol treatment. So if you're fine at 95 to 100, you probably don't need much more than oxygen, oxygen um, much more than... Um, steaming and, and, and oral hygiene okay all right i was just asking for um information purposes one other sure. thing um given how i've been very edified from this presentation i'm wondering if yourself or any other of your associate doctors would be willing to do this kind of presentation even over zoom um targeted to specific organizations such as a church because my church organization is uh, far above a thousand people island wide, oh. and we have regular Zoom meetings weekly. So it would be very beneficial if we could incorporate a health night and have this kind of presentation, as well as for my school staff, because not every teacher wants to take the vaccine because they've been doing research and hearing some of the disadvantages and so on. So having these alternative methods of dealing with the virus would be something they would welcome. So. I would like to know if that's possible. Can I contact you or is there another, you know, you contact? Can, you can, this work, uh, I wear a couple of hats. One of them is the president of medical strategies, which is about empowering and with knowledge as to how you can become COVID champions, COVID competent. With an audience of a thousand, that's rather efficient to allow us to get the information out. So we'll be happy to treat with you. Again, 3612686 is the number. I think it was posted on the slide if you took it down. Feel free to take it down now, 361 2686. Right. And then we yes, can treat with, treat with you going forward. It may not be me, maybe Dr. Heyman, Dr. Um, Dr. Jeremy Spencer, doc, Dr. Um, Michael James, and other doctors who are really COVID champions now and COVID enabled that will allow them to treat with COVID. So, All right, thanks. I'll be getting in touch with you, uh, someone, as soon as tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Um, let me get Dr. Brown in again. Dr. Brown, can we hear from you again? Hello. 
Hello, good night. Yes, hi. I had a couple of questions to ask quickly about availability. Quickly, okay. where does one get oxygen cylinders and fittings? Is it that is ordered from a specific company, let's say in Kingston, if, if so, which one? She's, um, okay, IGL, IGL is the monopoly for oxygen in Jamaica. There's no other company supplying oxygen, but IGL. Years and years and years ago, there used to be two, but it's been consolidated now for about 20, 30 years into just IGL. So IGL sells, and will they provide the fittings? The fittings, uh, you know I mean. IGL also supplies the fittings. But there are pharmacists okay. as well, such as Tree Angels Pharmacy in, 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 in Mandeville that can also supply the that. fittings. And Jamaica Hospital. Okay, another, well. another quick one. Yeah. Some patients had something called oxygenators, which I suspect were not oxygen cylinders. Right, they're concentrated. They take the air and concentrate the oxygen out of the air. Uh, but it generally, it can't get high flow with those machines. And it generally not. Okay, you can't get high flow. Flow, but it can help, but not high flow. Um, but what I'm saying, though, early base treatment, you don't need oxygen at all. That's the beauty. You don't, you don't need oxygen at all. From the my, last quick question experience. I would like to ask. From my the last experience. quick question I'd like to ask, and this is this is me not being anything now, but just straightforward. Um, someone asked in the chat, can we be legally, uh, I don't know, responsible or liable if we're using ivermectin that is not, I'm going to use the word, gazetted as a protocol for use in humans and if something uh, should go wrong with a patient who is on ivermectin and let's just say unlikely but they sue will we have a, a leg to stand on it's a very good question i'm not a lawyer i think we heard from a couple a lawyer mark earlier i know <laughs> uh, it's a tough one I, I would think though though in a pandemic that the law is can should should adapt and adopt uh, to the situation and the protocols i don't think it's a time to be imprisoning doctors to be to be to be worrying about that no you shouldn't be imprisoning um, it, doctors at a nurse at the time they're saving lives right and in the clinical presentation that you and Heyman, dr Heyman, has done and dr michael james i just want to get a sense of what you're actually using to determine the need for anticoagulants etc aside oh, yeah. from o2 saturation alone in other words are that you sending them for an x-ray on day seven are you sending them for a ct scan on day seven are you doing anything else or is it just o2 sat and clinical symptoms and not only that we're telling you that not everybody needs uh, <laughs> to have a positive test we have working diagnoses so if you have a working diagnosis that even if a negative test but you know that this patient has covid clinically you're going to treat covid clinically and if there's saturation in 79 like for me you steam, you steam, it brings it up. And then if you're back in normal zone, you're fine. But you must have, because you know the pulse optimizer, you can put it on a million times for the day. You just keep putting it on. So Okay. So if, if you, so to determine moving on for like cardiac slash renal slash pulmonary pulse, deterioration. Pulse optimization. But what, are you using pulse oxygen saturation only or are you also sending them for anything else like in, on day seven when you bring them back? Um, well, you don't necessarily bring them back because... You can't take I know, you, them you, at you home, come home. Right. So um, you can, okay, do, I just want you can to know. do tests uh, such as a blood count looking for white cell responses. Uh, you can also look at the kidney responses. Kidney function. function. Right. In term, and liver function. Okay. Uh, the medication. But the point remains that if you cannot get their oxygen saturation back up with whatever you uh, are doing, then uh, you have to refer to hospital. Below, below 88%, below 85%, you should be making your way to a center or a hospital. Dr. Jeremy and Spence is... Point. Is Hospital Bay West Center actually treats COVID? Not many private hospitals treat COVID, but Bay West Center in Montego Bay actually does. But we want to avoid that. A question yes, was asked definitely. earlier in the day what's the cost of someone who spends like 20, 30 days in ICU in a government hospital and dies? And that effective bill at 10,000 US dollars ICU cost per day, you're looking at about 20, 30 million Jamaican dollars. And then understood the dies. So if you can do early home-based treatment and it works, you don't have to be a businessman to recognize that really and truly you should be shifting your resources to earlier treatment. Because by the time anybody goes on a ventilator in Jamaica, 99.99% die. My name is Carol Green. I'm calling you from Montague Bay. I'm oh, not hi. a medical professional. I'm not a teacher. I am a Jamaica. Very interested in this. Somebody shared the link with me. And I shared it to some people, and I'm so glad to be on. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. My can question I also, is this. Can I yes? Also, before you ask, can I also commend you 
the YouTube early community-based treatment for COVID that was there last week for you to go watch, subscribe, and like that video. We I didn't get the name. That is one of the things I was going to ask early, you about. Early, early home-based community care for COVID. Yeah. And the next thing I want to find out, um, I've been hearing you introducing a number of doctors and where they are. Do you have, and you have also been saying that we must have a number for a doctor. I would like 100%. Right. This is not the time to be squeamish or shy. It's a national right. emergency. This is a national emergency. The most powerful organization in Jamaica with respect to the pandemic must be the Medical Association of Jamaica. That's it is right. not an organ of government. It's an organ of independent competence. The CMO is an organ of government because they're employed by government to carry out the policies of government. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I didn't hear much um, statements from the CMO read the election activities last year. It suggests that there's some constraint within the office of the CMO. There's some constraint because of the relationship between the CMO and government. But the Medical Association of Jamaica really is not an organ of government and should be an independent balanced voice based on scientific scientific, um, scientific findings and based on local experiences. Okay. Okay, thank you. I was gonna ask about doctors in Montego Bay um, who would be part of this. I got two names and so I will not need to ask. Thank you very much for the for the persons who put it in the chat and preempted my question. So thank you very much and I'm still listening. God bless you. And I am also, I also want to commend the gentleman who said he's a music teacher and that he's also an insurance person who wears many hats. The moment he's, he said something, I said, yes, this man is a man of God before he mentioned his church. And I want to commend him for being so vigilant in asking for the representation at his church. I had that in mind as well. So I'm going to go back to my church too and make a recommendation. And I was also think that we could probably all join if, if, it, if you know, that's what I don't know. For the better, it makes us efficient. I can host up to a thousand people on Great. that form of medical strategy. So we'll be more than happy to facilitate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll be praying for this organization. And I'd also like to commend you on the initiative with Haiti. Um, it, um, um, thank you for that as well. Okay, Amar, you've been very patient. You're next. Yes. Hi, Doc. How are you doing? I'm actually a businessman and I was very involved in lobbying the government to get them to sign the approval to import ivermectin. My, un my understanding is Lasco should, should have had the shipment in here uh, tomorrow but there's a okay. slight delay because the aircrafts are all full coming in with different sorts of cargo. My okay. understanding is that the shipment should be arriving on Monday and hopefully we'll have it cleared sometime early next week that will be available through the pharmacies all over Jamaica for the doctors and home treatments of, of, um, of right. COVID. COVID. Um, early, 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 early. Yeah. Bringing everything. Right. But this is powerful. You need this, Omar. Everybody must see this. A pulse right. oximeter. Yeah, pulse oximeter. I understand. Necessary. A million we need in Jamaica. Over a million. Also, the whole thing of my father, who is over 70 years old, um, contracted COVID. And his oxygen levels went down to 72. And home treatment, I got an oxygen tank. I got a doctor to send down a nebulizer down there with some steroidal inhalers, um, uh, anticoagulant aspirin, 82 milligrams, two different antibiotics to clear up the lungs. And within three days of him taking 24 milligrams of ivermectin per day, he was literally 100% better than he was. His O2 levels went up to over 90, um, it, it, high 80s, early, you know, high, um, low 90s. And five days later, he was much 100% better. So just in terms of nebulizing, um, kind of very good. Yeah. You can access a nebulizer with, with those items, the vitamin Ds, the vitamin Cs, the zinc, the gargling, like what you mentioned earlier, 
those are things that will assist in clearing up and getting people that they don't need to go to a hospital and have treatment. Omar, I, I want to echo that again. Uh, you know, uh, this, is, this, this story is so comforting and amazing in so many different ways, so many different ways. When, when my colleagues last year were um, rightfully cautious, but I, of course, am a little crazy, so I'll say, all right, let's charge. Let's take on the infirmities of our patients. Let's bear their burdens. Now, our doctors are now COVID champions and COVID enabled. So that comforts me that you are able to find a doctor to go into your dad's home, into your father's home and treat him. That was not happening last year. Yeah. It was all about taking somebody from their home and putting them in the hospital. The family right. can see them. Family can't get, you can't get information. You have to become, it was so horrible. So we now right. have a situation where people are now treating with directly at home. In terms yes. of the medication, I'm just happy that you got early home-based treatment. I am not saying it's ivermectin 24 milligram that did it. But one thing's for sure, if you ask me, I would put that nebulization with steam or whatever a little ahead of the ivermectin, in my view. Mm -hmm. I've seen people just with steam alone, just with steam alone, move their saturation from 85% to 100%. They cough things up. They feel 100% better. I am one of those. My saturation was 79%. I steamed. I coughed up some stuff, some exhaust, and my saturation remained in the 90s and continued through. Yes, I took ivermectin and other things. You know, as a doctor, I have access to stuff. But a lot of my patients can't afford more than steaming and brushing up teeth. I'm telling you that. That's how, that's how dire the situation is. But that yeah. thing has allowed people to live and not go to the hospital. Yeah. And we're not hearing from government. And Omar, I know you have the ears. Well, well what, I, what I will tell you is that... From there about steaming in hospital and having a policy that pivoted towards early home-based yeah. treatment. The Prime Minister spoke last week, Monday. He was invited to this meeting. He did not mention a word about early home-based treatment. He says, Taniyad, if you get better, that's fine. If you get sick, then go to the hospital. No, 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 no. We want treatment. We want treatment at home. And he needs to resonate that with his policy uh, advisors and to have a government rollout of home-based treatment. Right. What I will say to you, I, I have a relationship with Dr. Tess Laurie and Pierre Corey because I, I got them to do a joint letter to the minister and to the chief medical officer and prime minister advising them of the early home treatment mm -hmm. and also getting them to sign off to approve the ivermectin um so we have a relationship with them we have you know you can go online and see all the updated protocols for early treatment and i think we just need to get it done because our hospitals can't manage it but if we can manage it through home-based early treatment i think it would ease a lot of pressure from the government from the fiscal side of the government paying for all of this too and from patients who you know after they get over they they, 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 they COVID, they have a, a huge bill to pay, which may end up killing them after all of that. Absolutely right. It's, it's crazy. And then the worst of all, for those with the highest bill, they're not alive of a hard end. They, because yeah, they spend yeah. weeks in ICU, people trying to dialyze patients on ventilator, only to, for the inevitable to happen. Once you're on the ventilator in Jamaica, I think we need to say, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the family, this is not a treatment that works in Jamaica. If you get yeah. COVID and you reach a point where you need ventilation, so sorry, if it's like brain cancer, ventilation does not cure brain cancer. And you reach a point where you have brain cancer up to a point, and then after that, there's nothing further that can be done. Yeah. So the aim must be early treatment. Remember, before everybody becomes severe, you don't get up and become severe on day two or day three. It takes a time. So whilst you're at home watching, they're deteriorating and they don't have the pulse oximeter. My SAT was 79%. And without the pulse oximeter, I would never know because I didn't feel breathless. And that's why you hear stories of old oh, people all of a sudden crashing. No, they didn't all of a sudden because they didn't monitor their pulse oximeter. So if you monitor your pulse oximetry and see that you're in the 80s, 
you need to find a doctor. You need to start steaming, brush, brush your tongue, brush your teeth, floss, listerine, and take yourself out of the danger zone. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Alicia Savage, can you can you unmute Alicia? Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm a research scientist in the in New York, mm -hmm. and um, uh, thank you for having this forum for everyone to get an idea of how uh, people are coping with. Uh, diagnosis of uh, COVID. Um, um, I have a question about your strategy for Hurley home-based treatment. So are you saying that this is the only path forward or is this in addition to some kind of vaccination strategy? No, again, this is not about vaccination focus, this conversation. We mentioned that we recommend the vaccines, but certainly, as you can see with Israel, they're on their third booster and they're still seeing COVID. But we haven't heard, I've had patients from these states all the time saying, doctor, I've been told to go home and just watch. Nobody, so it seems it's not just a Jamaican government situation where patients are not being given specific prescriptions what to treat if you have COVID, so stay home and watch and monitor yourself. Remember, my oxygenation was 79%. I never once felt short of breath. So without the pulse oximeter, you'd have heard that oh, all of a sudden I'm short of breath with a saturation of 79%. People need to be told that early home-based treatment is important. It works only, it cannot be just monitoring yourself. It has to be active intervention, a process, steaming, 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 brush your teeth, floss, listerine, very important, basic starting points. Then we talk about ivermectin, then we talk about antibiotics, then we talk about dexmedazone, and we talk about blood thinning. It's going to be aspirin initially, it gets more, the sat is low, then we talk about Xarelto, Pradaxa, Eliquis. What about warfarin? Not Warfarin working. is very powerful. Very po In fact, if you ask me, I prefer Zorelto. It has the best profile products. It's almost like Warfarin, very, very powerful. But Warfarin can also be used. I think we're staying away from Warfarin. Why? Because Warfarin, you have to monitor your, your levels. And you don't want to be a situation where you're going back and forth. You want to minimize contact. So if you can get achieve the same with Zorelto, which is non-warp, which is non-blood test monitoring, or you can even use Clexane, the injectable at home. You can, you can use Clexane as well. So Warfarin is a bit strong. What I need to use Warfarin, I'd use Clexane. All right, thank you. You're welcome, keep safe. Let us know what happens in the winter. Keep my number and keep me posted. Sure. All right, bye. Okay, uh, Dr. Andre, let's get you, let's get you in. Hi, good night, Dr. Hunter. Good night. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, I'm glad that somebody is finally standing up and doing what should have been done a long time ago. So kudos to you for that. Um, I will say very frankly, I'm Dr. Andre Williams. I'm a consultant oncologist in Montego Bay. Hi. And at the moment, I'm extremely frustrated. In fact, I was actually in tears earlier today. It should be. Um, it almost and the reason. The reason. Yeah. So the reason is that I am a certified ozone practitioner. As at 2017, I trained at one of the top minds in the world on ozone therapy. And at that time, they had already documented clinical efficacy for ozone treatment and safety for SARS, the original SARS, as well as they had actually been contracted to visit Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak and had demonstrated clearly that there are, if they, they are yet to find a virus that is resistant to ozone therapy. Um, so when I anticipated that this virus inevitably affect Jamaica, I wrote to the Ministry of Health in January of 2020 and outlined all the relevant articles and made myself available to provide treatment for anybody who would be afflicted. I've not gotten a response as at today's date. I was actually engaged by some doctors in Peru who asked me to design a protocol for them which had, as at today's date, a 100% success rate with ill-hospitalized patients. 
I created a website, ozonejamaica.com. I had an article written in the Observer outlining um, the efficacy. And the website has all the latest literature outlining that ozone is 100% viricidal. The therapy is safe, easily administered. Medical professionals can be trained to administer it. And I know this talk is about early prevention, but the reality is I've had people who just walk into the office about to collapse. We put them on the machine, administer the treatment. And just with that first treatment, their O2, their O2 sats increase from the, low, the high 80s to mid 90s. I've treated myself when I had COVID. I treated my wife, treated my father, my mother, my sister. Um, there's only one patient that I can recall in ICU um, at Germain's hospital who did not respond immediately. And at the moment, um, Dr. Spencer, I don't have the yes, medical. Go ahead. That's Dr. Jermaine Spencer from Baylor Correct. Hospital Center, right? Yeah. Correct. Correct. A good friend of mine. He had asked me to come in and assist with an ICU patient admitted with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, as it is now, um, I've been treating whoever walks into the office here in Montego Bay. Um, I don't have the capital to do something like deploy the machines across the island. Right. And I'm putting it out there to the private sector that I am available to offer my expertise. I'm recognized internationally for my work. Um, if there's somebody who wants to invest in the machines, that can be those can be used to get some of these patients out of ICU. Um, so that's all I really want to say. I mean, I'm frustrated because I don't feel like there's been any uptake for the information for one reason or the other. And you know what that's like. Yes, yes. Um, Andre, the information. What, what I'd recommend, and it's something that I've found very useful as well. Yeah. Once you go, you know. Once you go, you know. You don't need to advertise yourself. But patients yeah. who are on the edge and their families, yeah. they will rise for you. They will be a champion for you. For instance, tonight we had the testimony, testimony of Senator Tom Tavares Finson, the head of the yeah. Senate, yeah. who had first hand knowledge of a patient that we treated at home. Yeah. And he absolutely sold. He sold on ivermectin as well. That yeah. is how we win this argument by experiential learning, by demonstrating and getting the people who have been successfully treated mm -hmm. to be advocates, to be COVID champions of your particular treatment. And that's how you get it moved forward, at least to start a conversation. And the private sector, they're they're listening. They're not, they're not, they don't want to hear about a hospital, hospital anymore. The model yeah. has failed. We know it yeah. is isolating COVID has failed. So yeah, no yeah. Of taxpayers' money necessarily be directed towards lockdown, lockdown, isolate. It has failed. The virus yeah. is everywhere. It mutated here months ago. It's not just from today. We're just yeah. not getting the results back from CARPA because we don't, we didn't spend the sixty million dollars to get mm. our own machine in Jamaica to tell us when the virus mutates. So we mm. need to just get on, get keep faithful to what we make good notes and to demonstrate that one nobody's dying nobody's being harmed, and then you're having positive results that people are living or eight out of ten you're making a good impact and that's mm. how you get get this conversation going by making sure that patients who clearly have seen the benefit who thought they were dead and now are alive that they will take that message forward for you thank you sir you're welcome. Keep doing a good job. By the way, oncology has done really bad in this pandemic. That cancer care has taken a big, big blow. That people with cancer have suffered terrible, inhumane delays in their treatment because mm. of COVID protocols that have been set up. And it's something that mm. we need to get rid of this delay that's killing people. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you for that question and the contribution. Sir Stuart, can we get you to un unmute? Thanks, Doc. Um, that's a little query on something that I heard the first doctor, the first um, doctor Heyman, Lamont. Heyman, uh, Heyman, right. Heyman. right. He, 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 like everybody else said that the, the first six days is really the critical period or, or something like that. So what I was wondering is, let's suppose um, it's day three that you kind of realize that you, you, you need to contact your doctor. Um, and then he, he you, you get treatment, no, the, the first, first, that first treatment. What is your O2 sat? What are you coming? If you're telling me that your O2 sat is 50%, 
you're not going to stay, you're not going to be able to do a home-based care. So if he comes in and your O2 sat is 95 to 100, you're going to be treated differently than if your O2 sat is 90 to 90 or less than 90. Just want to make that point. Okay. Very, very okay. But what, what would be, what was the first trigger to say, call your doctor? What's the first trigger? <laughs> Well, some of it may be just circumstantial that everybody in your family had COVID and you're worried about your status. So you call the doctor to get tested. So the doctor is also to test, facilitate testing just because you thought you may be exposed or that you need to go somewhere. So that's first thing. Second thing, if you're symptomatic, then what do I mean? You're a little tired, headache, sneeze, runny nose, loss of smell, your sore throat, itching at the back of your throat, pain at the back of your throat, a cough, a dry cough, very clear, dry cough. And as it gets worse, we're talking about a fever, 101 in my case, and chest pains, because as the inflammation in the lungs begun, you get chest pains. So that's different category of clinical right. severity, abdominal pain, diarrhea, muscle aches as well. So these oh, okay. categories of, of, of severity. But the O2 SAT is the final arbiter. It's such an important tool. And that's why we said, please, CMO, recommend it to Jamaica. Because without this, we cannot be objective and know how severe someone is. Because they look good, but their SAT could be in the 80s or the 70s. What I was really trying to get to was just how, how you count this. Because he kept saying, um, you come back on day seven. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't know if day seven meant from the from the day one or is it from yes, three? or from when you got treated the first time. Three, and that's what I was kind of wondering. But he kept saying day seven. And not I say not important, not important. What's important is that right. you have had a connection with your doctor and you can now send information because if your sats are 99 100 percent at day seven won't change day eight, your sat is 99%. To okay. become somebody who doesn't even need to come back to the hospital. You can just get a virtual sign up. You don't have to come back to the office. No, well, he didn't even say, well, okay, that's that was really what I was I was kind of thinking. If I got you know, it could be apparent that you are aware that yes, you are, you have some symptoms, but you didn't act immediately. So, you know, it's just a question of which is day one. And then if you got treated on let's say it was day three after you really had the symptoms, do you wait until, There's a variation. you know? In terms of start from point of exposure to symptomatic, that's a variation too. So classically they tell you from two days, minimum of two days incubation period to symptom to 14 days. So from the exposure to the infection, the earliest you'll get symptom is like after two days. And the latest you'll get symptom is after 14 days. And that's why the 14 day quarantine came about because they want to make sure that you're not going to develop COVID after 14 days. Well, of course, that's unrealistic if you travel overseas to sit down in a hotel room for 14 days to then become active. That can be unrealistic. And I just wanted to suggest that although persons are asking you if you can come and make this um, presentation, I mean, there's also another way that it can be done in the sense that if you can save it on on YouTube, YouTube right, and, and you can play it, available. you can play it for an audience. You know, I, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's really, it's gonna. I mean, tonight I sacrifice tonight. I'll stay till two a.m. And I, I told myself I'll stay up till two o'clock this morning, yeah. this morning, which is mm -hmm. Thursday, until every question is answered. It's really important right. that we become COVID champions, COVID competent. So everybody should leave right. tonight knowing oral hygiene is a must. Steaming is a must. And we want the government hospitals to start steaming. There's, I forgot, there was a question I wanted to bring back about the nebulization. In government hospitals, it's hell to get people to be nebulized because they say, well, if you nebulize it, you're going to spread the virus through the air. And we saw the consequences of that hesitation, that 17-year-old asthmatic that came to University Hospital earlier this year who actually didn't make it because there was some vacillation around nebulization. And the hesitation to nebulize caused the 17 year old asthmatic to die. So, nebulization is something that can be done at home, but steaming is the key, not just nebulizing and blasting uh, mist into your lungs, but steaming, evaporating it into your lungs is just as effective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Gregor Fong, can you unmute yourself?
Gregor? Thank you, Alicia. Dr. Hunter, um, I was just commenting. I would love you to get some water to drink, sir. Thank you. That's one. I'm concerned that you don't have anything. I saw it empty. I saw it empty an hour when I got concerned. I'm a guidance counselor, so you can imagine. Yes, thank yes. you. So um, you can have some water. Let the colleagues take over for you in two minutes while you get some water. My, yes. my question quickly, I'm curious about the evidence regarding mask wearing. Is it that most persons who end up getting COVID were also not wearing masks or practicing the other protocols? Because the concern I have is that it's not being said. So it kind of makes mask wearing not, not be as attractive. There's no quote unquote efficacy, that's a new buzzword. Does mask wearing really help? We know it helps to reduce exposure, but is it that persons who end up in hospital, et cetera, or get infected tend to be demographically those who are not wearing their mask or do mask wearers still get COVID? If so to speak, thank you. That requires a specific research around that, but I think statistically most people who are COVID positive are wearing masks. And it's something that we saw very early on because masks became mandatory and became the law. Hello, yes, welcome. We'll have Dr. Leroy Heyman back. I'm gonna leave him with you. Are you back with us, Leroy? Yes, I get some water, sir. I'm gonna get some water, yes. Water actually yes. works. It don't have to be steamed this time, but I'll get water. Yes. In terms of the mask, statistically, most people are gonna be wearing masks. So you'd have to find a category of people Maybe, maybe in a particular area in Jamaica that don't practice mask wearing and then, you know, balance them against those who are wearing masks. Kind of impossible to set up in Jamaica. I just saw that the rubric of those who went into hospital, one of the questions they asked them, apart from contact tracing, is were you wearing a mask? That was my concern if there was any data out there already. But, but thank you for answering the other two questions I have. Mm -hmm. I don't think you will touch on what's happening tomorrow, sir. Yes, that's fine. But remember, no, there's going to be verdict. Remember, there's not, this is an interim study. There's no final verdict as yet. In five years' time, we may yeah. well conclude that people who wore masks actually prolonged the epidemic. We may well conclude that because there's a oh. suggestion that if you block the virus from coming in, you're blocking your ability to develop immune strength and immune competence. Yes. So when it hits you, you have less right. immunity. Because we sure. need to get small particles. So it's yet, we will all abide by the protocols and wear masks, but the verdict is not yet over. Uh, just like how last year we were told that if you, have, if you have COVID, but you don't have symptoms, you can't pass on the virus. Now, of course, I know that right. was wrong. Totally wrong. Dr. Fortier, you didn't need to wear a mask. Dr. Fortier said that, he said it. WHO said you don't need to wear a mask, but it's in the mask. The same old echo that I knew that was wrong. Once you have an infection, there are a group of people that will be asymptomatic and they can still pass it on. Just think of HIV. Asymptomatic, they look good, but guess what? They can still pass on HIV. Years, thank you. Yes, absolutely. The thank you so much. Being, being developed last year, no doctor wanted to treat COVID. This year, COVID champions, COVID competence is emerging. Early treatment, sir. Dominantly. So thank you for your yes, question. Sir, keep thank, you for thank you. I will try. Yes, Dr. Sir. Haven, thank you. Have a good Enjoy night. Enjoy that water, sir. Keep listening, keep listening in. I'm going to go for some water. I'm going to hand you back to my co-host, Dr. Heyman. Are you back with us? Can I hear you? Dr. Heyman, can you unmute yourself? Are you back, sir? <clears throat> yes, boy. I apologize God bless you. to God bless you. Uh, the participants. You. Apparently, Half of the participants were on um, were muted, um, oh, so we had to go back into security, and um, we had to uh, uncheck that. So everybody's phone should be have the option now to to unmute um, yourself. So we do apologize for that. I've been trying to get on for the past hour, and I was unable because the co-hosts um, there was a certain um, that that locked us. So I'm back, and um, I um, I wanted to answer a question from a pharmacist who, and, who asked one earlier. Um, the dosage of ivermectin is uh, based on the formula 0 0.3 to 0.4 uh, milligrams per kilogram. So, of course, an 80 kilogram man will require less than say a man who is 100 kilograms or 120. We use that formula and we calcul calculate. All right, um, who is next now for question? Um, 
All right. Uh, 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 my screen cannot show uh, the hands that are up. So can somebody uh, go ahead and ask a question? I would, I, would, I would prefer for the remaining few minutes we have, because it's pretty late now, that we keep focus on what our fundamental message is tonight, which is basically uh, early treatment, home-based monitoring, uh, resulting in less hospitalizations and death. So please, I would appreciate if the remaining questions is focus around this so we can get back to the real message that we are trying to deliver. Thank you. Patricia Headley. Okay, go ahead. Yes, guidance counselor. I asked a question before, but I have another question, which is, um, is it possible for um, you to demonstrate? I don't know if you would be able to do it tonight, but um, we need to know exactly the proper way to do the steaming. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, there is a more effective way than what we... Uh, All right, let's I, see. I, I just let's, want to do that, yes. Okay, let's see how best we can... Um, uh, make that possible. Um, it's pretty. Uh, okay. First of all, you need to have a, a basin that can accommodate hot water. That's the first thing. Okay. Once you have established that, because you don't want one that will melt with the hot water, you want one that will accommodate the hot water. You put your kettle on or a pot if you don't have a kettle. And um, you fill it and you put it to boiling. Once it starts to steam, you pour that into that bowl or basin that you're going to use to um, accommodate the hot water. Um, if you're going to use a mental crystal, you need a very tiny amount, very small piece, almost um, the length of your fingernail, very small piece. And then you drop it into the water. And then you place a towel over your head, from your back over your head, and you put it around uh, the basin. So the basin around it should be covered with a towel. So what's going to happen now is that all that uh, steam will come right into your face. Now, it's, when it just starts, it's going to be quite um, harsh. So you may have to Un unpull the towel and um, go back to some uh, regular room air. But once you go over it, we recommend that you allow it to come on your face and then you nose breathe. So that's where the virus is in your nose. So you take deep breaths and blow it out. Um, so, so the hot, hot air, um, air can go in your nose. And then we recommend that you also you mouth breathe also. You inhale through your mouth, and we recommend that you try to swallow that, that hot hair. It's not going to do any damage there. You try to swallow it to get it down into your throat. So once you do that several times for about uh, 10 minutes, through your no breathe through your nose, and then breathe through, uh, through your mouth, then um, as soon as the water starts to cool down, you can stop. And so you'll feel much, much, much better. As, as we said, the steaming is essential in the first um, <coughs> six days because what we're trying to do is reduce the viral load and steaming has been proven to be one of the most effective uh, non-pharmacological um, way of getting the viral load down or getting less virus in your, in your throat and in your nasal passage. I hope you could have figured that while I was explaining, but that's the, that's the best way I can explain it to you at this time of the night. Understood perfectly. Okay, the gentleman who asked early on, we, I try to categorize the days of your symptoms so it's easy to understand. The first day is when your symptoms start. So, say today the 18th of um, august you start to have a fever you start to have a chill a cold feeling or a headache that is considered the first day of your symptom so the second day would be tomorrow uh, thursday the third day would be friday 
the fourth day will be Saturday, the fifth day will be Sunday, the sixth day would be Monday, and the seventh day would be Tuesday. So that's how that's how we counted for easy, an easy way for you to understand. Now, what happened was that we want to catch you in the first six days. In other words, this is when the virus, you have uh, contacted a virus from maybe a week before or up to 10 days before because the incubation period or the period in which you contract the virus and you start having symptoms, it varies from about um, four to about 10 days. We normally use an average of about uh, seven days, um, but sometimes this can go up to 14 days. So when, when your symptoms start, that's not the day you contract the virus. You, you would have contracted the virus approximately seven days uh, prior to that. So if you go untreated, usually from day seven of your symptoms, starting from the first day, as I defined earlier, that's when the, the, the infection normally take a turn for the worse and it can rapidly spread um, to affect your lung, your heart, your kidneys. So that's why I'm saying we need to pay attention to the first six days because that's, where, that's what happens in that period is going to determine your outcome. So if you, if you remember all the things I had on the slide, um, you pay attention to that, then by the time you reach the seven day, your outcome will start to look bright. You'll start to get better already. So that's why we're emphasizing early treatment. Does that explain everything now? Yes, it's, it's clear, it's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I, 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 was, I wanted to explain this a long time, but um, so the, 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 as the days go by without treatment, you get worse and, and um, you, you get worse. So it is very important that you pay attention to the first six days because that's where you want to decrease the viral load. That's when you want to decrease the inflammation and your outcome would be much, much, much brighter. Now, as I mentioned before, when the, when the Delta variant, which is here already, um, comes on board, the, the symptoms are going to be uh, more severe than what we're seeing now. So it's going to be even more important to focus on those uh, early six days because um, diarrhea, vomiting are two of the, the main symptoms it comes with, and you can get dehydration very fast. So we, you need to see a doctor within that six day, early six day period. So we can correct your fluid balance. We can um, treat the other symptoms that might be there for your outcome to look very, very bright. Okay. And then um, I mentioned also earlier that on day seven, if you start to de deteriorate in your symptoms, then we usually add uh, two other medications, um, the uh, steroids, which we use the dexamethasone or prednisone, and we usually use a little lower dose than what is used in the hospital. And then we use the, the blood thinners um, to help also because clotting is an important part of the um, pathophysiology of the, of the infection. All oh, right, I have, question? I have, I have a question. Yes. So, um, studies have already shown that ivermectin um, seems to stop the replication of COVID, but this is only for the alpha variant. So now that Delta is now there in uh, Jamaica, do you think that this would remain a viable strategy going forward for early intervention? Okay, very uh, important question. Because today when I heard it announced that um, the Ministry of Health has posted that we have 22 cases, I started to rethink and we need to now decide how we're going to uh, tackle, tackle this, um, this new variant. Because as I mentioned before, the symptoms are, are going to be more severe. So let's look at why we use the ivermectin early. One. Uh, from the research, it, as you mentioned, it does uh, decrease viral replication. We believe that happens. Secondly, 
We believe also that it is an anti-inflammatory uh, medication, which we need to prevent your major organs from getting inflamed and causing a serious um, illness. Um, in answering to your question now, we will have to just see the response uh, from, from using the ivermectin. And um, we will use it, as I say, in the first six days. And then hopefully by the time we have a, a new uh, update session, I can let you know what our experience is going to be like with this new, new variant. But for now, yes, we will continue to use it until we have more information to say, boy, it's not working or it's, it's working. The other question I have is, um, with these early intervention strategies, are there any MRI studies done on patients, COVID positive <laughs> patients, to look at their um, brain morphology? I mean, we've already seen that uh, there have been severe clotting in a lot of cases, for especially for COVID long haulers. So are you also, um, using that strategy in your treatment? Well, investigations are always going to be an important part of um, treatment. Um, it will guide us to um, help us to better understand. Um, yes, if patients can afford it, um, we will recommend it. Um, but from my experience working in central Jamaica, most of the patients bar they can't even afford the medication. So uh, um, to do even the simple blood test to see their renal or kidney function, their liver function, some patients have it real challenging to do those tests. So um, yes, we want to look at as much um, tests as possible, but it, it's gonna boil down to affordability. We also have another um, blood test we can do called a D-dimer which um, will give us a guide of, um, of clotting also. Uh, it seems like um, so far from uh, some of the studies I've reviewed, the COVID long haulers aren't necessarily symptomatic. They are often asymptomatic. So they end up dying from stroke, from reinfection. So right. um, go ahead. Yeah, but what, what, what we're saying is that if you are treated early, if we start yeah. to monitor you from early, then I believe so when we actually put our data together, yeah, when we actually put our data, all right, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I, I'm referring to people who are asymptomatic and are, right. are tentatively COVID long haulers. In other words, they have brain fog without the coughing, the sneezing, the congestion, and all the other uh, symptoms that go along with COVID. But um, they end up dying from stroke later on from the clotting that's produced from the COVID. It essentially, they're walking well, around and they're fine, but there's some studies that show that they're also COVID long haulers. Uh, yes, so as, as the studies come out, um, these will help us to I mean, adjust our, our, our treatment uh, options. And um, we have to look at more preventive uh, treatment to prevent like the strokes or um, uh, myocardial or uh, infarction or heart attack. Um, definitely would have to focus on how we will treat them to, to prevent these, um, these issues that you have defined. I see. So there's no real strategy for asymptomatic patients or well, early on treatment for them. Because if they're not aware of their symptoms, how would you treat that? Outside of um, getting you mean, or oh, you mean like patients who are asymptomatic and um, yeah, well, well, that's the challenge um, that, that we're facing right now. We do, I mean, we, usually we don't test um, the asymptomatic <laughs> patients, but okay. um, unless somebody really want to know whether they have it, but the rule usually is that we don't test um, the asymptomatic patients. So um, whether, they are, whether they have the virus yeah. or, or they're being carriers of the virus and they're being infected um, in one way or the other and their major organs are getting um, damaged uh, without knowing, 
uh, that is something that we definitely will have to look into um, uh, the, in um, the near want, future. Could, could I intervene here? Because this, I, I, I remember Dr. Hunter saying that um, even though his, the, his saturation levels went down to 79, he was breathing fine. Now, I, I will admit he had symptoms, but is it possible that if you are asymptomatic and you still use the pulse oximeter, would it give you a clue? Yes, it would. It would. But and then if you, so then the answer to your question would be get one and uh, periodically check it, whether you're feeling good or not. Yeah, that, and then, that, that and might then, be, and then, that, that might be a good you, suggestion or, or go tested regularly, but, um, we, but if you, we don't if really you, recommend we don't really recommend that but if you have it if you have it it's easy to test it right so i'm just saying if you are asymptomatic actually but no it's not it's not easy to test because the commonly available tests were negative for me i was covid positive but that was only determined oh, no. by the cdc so none of the uh, over-the-counter tests worked for me. No, I wasn't talking about the COVID test. I'm talking about the test that you can do for yourself with the pulse oximeter. That's I why I was asking you, if you can, if you have one and you, you doctors are saying you, we should have one. So if yes, you keep one, then at least that may give you a clue. I'm, I'm just saying that. Yes, yeah, that, 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 that is true. That is definitely true. It will give you a clue that um, something is going wrong, wrong. yes. Oh. I know people who are COVID positive. I know people who are COVID positive because we've tested them and they, the pulsometer does nothing. It's 98%, 99%. Yeah. And they've tested positive twice, PCR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's so another. Here in the United States, we actually test asymptomatic people. I have to get tested every other day to go to work. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> So. Can we move on to the next question? Because we need to wrap up uh, soon. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thanks for answering my questions. Thank you very much. Thank Flora you. Garth is up next. Flora Garth, can you unmute yourself, please? I am not Flora. <laughs> I'm her husband, Peter Garth. And I have two questions to ask. One, I am concerned about the cost. Do you know what is the cost of treating a patient at home using all the things that were mentioned. What is Thank the you. average cost? Is it a food to the, the poor person? Okay, that's an excellent question there. And um, yeah, once we're promoting um, home care um, monitoring, then we definitely would have to put some figures to it. So. If you remember my, um, my flow chart, um, basic uh, mild uh, symptoms, uh, those, those with mild risks that we mentioned, we just maybe order some antipyretic, um, anti-fever medicine or analgesics, which is pain medication. The one commonly used is paracetamol. If we add the price of that, say for a week, and we had a pack of um, mental crystal, and we had a pack of, um, at around uh, 30 Rodoxone, which is a vitamin C plus zinc. If we had another 30 tablets of vitamin D, that basic uh, pharmacy bill, along with the professional cost. So there are two costs, the professional costs and the pharmaceutical costs we're looking at around uh, $8,000 cash. Um, persons who have in, um, insurance, um, that figure will go down significantly, maybe by about uh, 40%. So we're looking at maybe somewhere between five and 8,000 for, um, for the mild cases. If we're gonna add ivermectin, if we're gonna add, um, the steroid dexamethasone, and we're gonna add the blood thinners to that, we are gonna look at around maybe 40,000 cash. Um, some patients will need antibiotics if they get a secondary infection. Some patients may get a fungal infection like oral candidiasis. 
So if we add all those pharmaceutical costs, uh, assuming a patient has to go on everything there with the professional fees, it will come to maybe around $54,000, dollars cash. But the insurance okay. patient will get um, maybe 40% less than that. If, 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 you, if you removed all the patients now who are hospitalized, not those who are in necessarily ICU and on the ventilator, uh, this home treatment, a doctor is necessary. Uh, would you be able now at this point in time to handle all of those patients from home? At the hospital? In other words, do we uh, have enough doctors? who are used will be prepared to use the ivermectin and all the other things not just the mild case you know you know um, do we have enough doctors who are prepared and right. ready and i uh, will be using um all the things first that of you all about? first of all we don't usually recommend the ivermectin for mild cases we normally uh recommend it in, in the first six days if you're a risk factor if you're if we assess your risk and and then you are you fall into the category of developing a severe illness that's when that's when we add it now we have uh, physicians right across the island we have doctors in Montego Bay uh, St Elizabeth Trelawney St Anne Kingston Clarendon Manchester we do have doctors um, who are who are treating in their offices or are monitoring their patients from home. But I think looking at the, the, the numbers I know of, um, we still need other doctors to come on board. So that's why I recommend in my summary that we need other doctors to come in and be a part of this, this movement. Because if, if this really occur right across the island, then we're going to see a tremendous um, decline in the amount of patients um, going into the hospitals. And then th what we want to do is to reach a stage where the hospitals might come begging us and say, boy, <laughs> send us some patients because they're not seeing them. But this is, this is, our, ultimate, this is our ultimate goal. So um, yes, we're um, I can't tell you a definite number of physicians who are treating, but we are scattered across the island, but we, we do need more to come in to be a part of this movement. Yeah, one quick thing, because there must be the other side, the national fiscal position. If you are talking about, let's use the high figure, you said about approximately $50,000. Now, have you um, considered the cost of having somebody at, at the hospital, the government hospital, the cost to, you know, patient government? What, what is the cost when they go there? All right. Well, it's going to be maybe about um, 10 times that. Um, We're looking at oxygen. I think a hundred pound cylinder might be about uh, four to $5,000. I, I could be wrong there, but I think it's somewhere in that figure. And most patients who are on say 10 liters per day will maybe require two 200 pound cylinders. So we'll get right away at $10,000 somewhere on uh, 30, 40, some go as high as, uh, as 50, 50 liters um, high flow um, <clears throat> oxygen, then um, the cost is tremendous. So for somebody who is in hospital, who is getting oxygen, who is getting blood thinners, who is getting antibiotics, who is getting uh, professional care from nurses and doctors and assistants um, on the ward, I think the figure should be, it's costing the government, I should say, around maybe $500,000. Uh, and if you go um, to the stage where you need to be put on a ventilator, then, I mean, the cost, I mean, will, will go high into the millions. So this is really a, a, a tremendous difference in, 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 in the figures because, um, uh, the government uh, is doing a great job there in providing all the service at the hospital. So we really have to say thanks to them for the tremendous um, work they're doing there. It's, it's very costly. 
But what we're saying is that um, if the, I hope the government officials are listening. If we can get this program going for early treatment and we monitor the patients at home, then that cost to treat a patient would be significantly reduced. And so the funds can be used to spend on other important projects for the country and also to do you know, other, other important business that the, the, the country need to get on at this time. So it's, the cost in the hospital is, is, is tremendous. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, very good. Very good. To that. And yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. One of the things that we will be lobbying for, and um, Roger went for a little break there, but um, he's a man run, running for the, the president elect of the Medical Association. One of the things we will be lobbying, lobbying for um, as soon as we, um, you know, um, have, have the chance, we'll be asking our finance minister to take a look at these um, important medications that we're using that are of benefit to the, um, to the patient. Um, ivermectin is not so bad. I mean, uh, they, I, I understand that we're now getting newer preparations of the 12 milligram tablet, which is a single tablet. The other tablets come as three milligrams. So you have to take four of the three milligrams. Um, they, I mean, one of the three, uh, three milligrams is being sold now for about a thousand dollars, but the, 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 the 12 milligrams I'm told uh, will be sold for approximately $450. So a dose of ivermectin can maybe be cut down in the near future to just $900. So mm -hmm. the, the medication that really costs a lot um, are, are, the, are, are the blood thinners that we need to as an important part. Um, the ones that we give subcutaneous and the oral ones, that's where the money is. And um, those bills can go um, high. And so if we can get the duty to be wavered on those, if we can bring in those at a less cost, trust me, the figure I tell you about 55,000 for the full treatment, that can be cut to maybe half of that. And if you have insurance, then you take off another another 40%. So this is something that we'll be lobbying for uh, so more patients can have access to these um, medications as an old patient. Doc, that gentleman who spoke mm -hmm. out of Montego Bay, Andre, that has perfected that treatment that he did a, 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 a prototype or in fact a, a model for Peru that has a 100% success rate. Um, he spoke earlier on on the program. I think some ozone yeah. treatment I'm, or something I'm like that. I'm still here. I'm still here, Doc. Yes. That, I'm wondering if that gentleman shouldn't be speedily called in by the Ministry of Health. Couldn't a phone call be made by you, sir, to the Ministry of Health or the Minister for them to get him right now to address some of those dying patients in the different um, ICUs over the island? From what he has said, it's a proven method of success. We shouldn't be having this man lingering at all. And we should do everything possible coming out of this program to get him at the place where his recommendation can be made to the minister and to the ministry. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Peter Gart is online from the J J Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches. I'm here also as a senior person. I'm prepared to do what we can do to get a call to the prime minister to get this gentleman and get some attention. It's important. Well, as I said, we will be lobbying um, after this um, meeting tonight, um, let's stay focused on what we're saying, early treatment, um, home-based monitoring um, will result in less hospitalization and treatment. Uh, these patients in the hospital, some of them are far advanced in their illnesses. Um, so whatever we can use to help um, get them better, um, yes, definitely we'll be lobbying to see if we can get assistance. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna, Andre, you're still there. I'm gonna give you my number. Please to call me and we're gonna see what we can do to get some attention for your treatment. My number is 876-383-6435. Okay, I will call you right now, sir. Yes, please. <laughs> All right, that's, uh, that, that's business, that's business, eh? <laughs> All right. Any more uh, questions? Uh, any more questions on early treatment, uh, home-based monitoring? Next any, up is any other treatment? Focus on that. Next in line is Keith Spence. 
Uh, <clears throat> can... Yeah, good night. Good night, guys. Congratulations good night. on this, this program. I really, really appreciate you doing this. But I just wanted to ask you, Doc, um, is the protocol the same for early home based treatment as it is for like um, persons that would have been fully vaccinated and have a breakout? Would it be the same application or that might have to be looked at in a different way? Uh, no, the, an the answer to you is yes, but vaccinated people they get a much, much, much milder uh, infection from what I have been seeing with the few who have received the vaccine so far who get, uh, who get the infection. Their symptoms are usually milder. They have a less severe illness. So we will treat them in the mild category. We will monitor them in the same way, as I said, uh, from day one of the symptoms. We will review them on day seven to see if it did, the, it did the illness progress. And yes, the, the guidelines I'm recommending on this program tonight, yes, we definitely will follow that because um, in, we have seen a couple of severe cases. Um, most of the patients who are vaccinated, they are going to get a less severe infection. But we do have some who get moderate to severe um, according to the reports that are coming out. So yes, we will treat them in the same way as we defined earlier in the, in the discussion. Let's move over to Tioma. Yes, I'm here and it's Tioma. Thank you. So um, I have a few questions. First of all, I wanna thank all you doctors for spending this long time with us here today, restoring our faith <laughs> in the medical establishment, certainly for me, I am so overjoyed to see someone speaking out, you know, in a way that's going to save or has the potential to save so many people. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, I have a couple of questions. One is, if you're speaking about prevention, then surely we have to make sure that very early prevention, as in before it before it happens. I know we were speaking about vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, quercetin, and um, all of this. But I think people need to understand that that's not just when you get the virus. Uh, it just needs to be made clear that you take that, you know, on a daily basis now, and that um, stress reduction is very very important. And that it's also very important to rest, you know, all of this before, go to the sea. You know, my grandmother who in 1918 uh, was faced with the, the flu, which took her only sister who lived in Mobe. She had her children flush their nostrils out with salt water in those days, and they were all fine. Okay, this doesn't constitute a study, but I'm saying people have been doing this as prevention for a long time. So that going to the sea where you get your vitamin D directly from the sun and you're able to actually completely flush out your uh, respiratory, upper respiratory system should not be discouraged. It should not. And um, I think that we also wanna talk about um, the reduction in stress and the reduction in fear and let people know that there are ways. And certainly a lot of people listening to your presentation must say, yes, you know, I'm feeling much more confident now in facing this, you know, thing. Um, certainly when you listen to government and to many doctors, you know, that you are left in a state of complete angst and it's not good for your immune system. The other thing I will say is that meat eaters, and I'm not, you know, people have ideas about this, but the fact is that meat eaters have thicker blood. So we want to encourage a lot of plant-based eating is very, very important. And a lot of, you know, drinking lots and lots of water. We, it was mentioned to drink four liters of, I think, juice earlier. Um, I would mention that, you know, there's a lot of sugar in juice. And if we're trying to make sure that people's um, glucose level doesn't shoot through the roof, we wanna say four liters of water, or, you know, maybe three liters of water and one liter of dilute homemade juice, preferably. And um, we are, you know, the, the elephant in the room is not just COVID. One of the elephants in the room is that we have an amazing, amazing 
um, army of uh, herbs or herbs, some people say here in Jamaica, and they're very powerful. And most people will turn to these before they're either able to afford or able to access uh, medicines. You know, uh, they will use their natural medicines, their medicines that grow around them. So things like fever grass for the fever, you know, our own eucalyptus leaves and eucalyptus oil, which is so easily accessible also in the supermarkets, you know, acts very much like the camphor. You know, we, we have so many flu and you know there's people have been using oregano oil people have been using so all of those remedies i know that's maybe beyond your purview but maybe we need to all link together now because there's a lot there's a lot of studies being done on these herbs and we need to just access them and not be acting you know in our own little camps you know just doing our own thing we need to really reach out and link hands right now because that's what a lot of people have and they need to know that it's okay to use them as well. So, um, I okay, think- I, I, I thank you for your observations and comments. Anything to um, keep your immune system strong to fight off infections? But from um, my experience in treating patients, the fit to get the um, contract the um, the virus, the unfit uh, get it. Those are in the middle still contract it. So even though we you are paying particular attention to the fitness part of it and um, improving and enhancing the immune system, we still remember the fundamental fundamental message tonight. If you become symptoms from the virus, you come to us early for for treatment. But we. We thank you for your observations and, and your comments. Certainly. All right. We have time for two more questions, two more, and then we got to wrap up. Uh, and then we, and unless Roger want to continue, yeah. but um, let's, let, let me take two more questions. Um, yeah, I, I can continue, sir, host. host. Oh, okay. All right. So I, w- I will take two more questions and then you can continue. Right. Yeah. Um, for the before, for the other others. Before I leave, can I just ask also, how would you feel about deploying nurses or specially trained people so that they can go back and forth to the home and take some alleviate some of the burden on the doctors, so that then you you know you have more arms, more legs, more power to reach more people. Yeah. You uh, mean uh, as part of our. Uh, uh, home-based monitoring exactly as part of your team can i can well, i take that okay one? oh you want to take that one all right okay roger go ahead yeah i thought about this long time ago these are extraordinary times they cannot apply the same strategies in extraordinary times okay during a national election you have electoral uh, positions all over and on that one day you have what you call this one day police you have appointment of constables for the day I think that's something like that is needed with COVID because there are not enough doctors and nurses to cover the entire Jamaica and to put into people's homes the access to one to either or. And you know, in Jamaica, only doctors have pres- prescribing rights. So technically, it's only doctors can prescribe a medicine, including ivermectin. But it's just not enough of us. And one of the things in going through this home-based treatment thing, I asked. I had to ask several of my patients, do you have a doctor the outside of me? Do you have a doctor friend? And they said, no, no doc, I don't have no doctor's number. So that is what needs to change. We need to see how we can get more of our colleagues to allow their numbers to be available. But to your point, yes, I think the solution ultimately is to create COVID champions. Remember my last slide, COVID champions, COVID competence. We need to make the uh, some, some people enabled to give the steaming, the brush teeth, Listerine advice, the SPO2 interpretation, and the ivermectin, just these specific medications specific to the treatment of COVID and nothing else, just restricted to COVID competence, just to be able to reach everybody so that by doing so, we can save everybody from dying. So yes, I would agree with the point that you're recommending to make everybody, not just doctors, not just nurses, but everybody COVID competent. We know that in, in, in the United States and in England, for instance, vaccination is not just given by nurses and doctors alone. It's also given by people trained to give vaccines. 
So we need to apply that sort of thinking regarding COVID. Thank you again. Okay, one more question for me. Micheline. Hi, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. I just wanted to find out um, in regards to multivitamins, even though the ratio may not be the equivalent of what you mentioned, is that still okay to take daily? First question. Leroy, you want to get that one? Um, every, every medication has a, has a dosage guideline. Um, so as long as we, we fall into that guideline, then um, you'll be okay. Some people take like the one that is abused a lot is vitamin B. So when we objectively, objectively test their blood samples, we'll find that the vitamin B level is much higher than normal. So as long as you stick in, in the prescribed amount that the, uh, the doctor gives you, then if you suspect anything, as I said, we can, we can do a lab test to, to either cut you down or stop it for a while. Um, but the, the vitamins do play an important part in our body's function and especially with regards to our immune system. So you do recommend us yes. be yes, able to just pull over the counter multivitamin, that's fine. Oh, oh yes, yes but Hello? I mean, you need to do it um, on the guidance also, because we don't okay. want you to and overdose I... yourself. All right, and my second question, I understand and hear everyone, the doctor saying that you recommend the vaccine, not necessarily that it should be mandated at this time, but in terms of the companies currently, they are looking to mandate it. And I guess the only way we be able to prove our home remedies and home care is that they're saying you need to do weekly antigen tests. Uh, question, are there any negatives to doing this so often, these weekly antigen tests? Oh, I'm not sure um, I'm with that statement, though, Leroy. Uh, that you have, the only way to prove... Go, go ahead, Roger. Sorry, sorry, Leroy. The only way to prove the home-based remedy is to do weekly antigen tests. Um, no. Well, in terms of they're going to be saying, no, in, if you're not going to do the vaccine, then you need to do this in place of it. No, what, what I think what you meant to say is weekly or not really weekly, but twice weekly or, or three times a week. Um, antibody, antibody tests, antibody, not the antigen, but antibody tests. Because we are treating people who had the antigen in them and the antigen is a virus and a virus then, then elicits or creates an antibody response. And those antibodies we then measure so it's an antibody test, I think, that you, you wanted to ask. Is that a quick test that persons do when they're going abroad? Well, that's an antigen test. Yes, the antigen test. Antigen test is neither here nor there. If you're vaccinated, you can still be positive. If you're unvaccinated, you can still be counted. If you had COVID, you can still be positive. But the antibody test tells you that your level of antibodies to fight the virus is very high. So there's no chance or there's good chance or no chance that you'll have an infection because your antibody levels are high. So the antibody tests, there are also home kits for antibody tests. Well, but, what the company is going to be my, rapid my antigen tests. So uh, that is what I wanted to just verify. Antigen tests is no, wouldn't distinguish whether you're vaccinated or not. We have all accepted that vaccinated and the unvaccinated will get coronavirus in their nose and antigen tests will detect the virus, but it won't tell you if you're sick or not. Okay. But no, I, th I think what she was referring to, Roger, is um, she was asking for the persons who are unvaccinated, right. if there should be some uh, rules or um, laws governing going to a workplace and they um, may require you to do regular right. antigen, antigen testing, oh. like say every right. other day or every three days, yeah. if uh, yeah. there's going to be any problems. No, there won't be any problems. It's just that it's, it's a cost. Um, there's, uh, there's a cost factor. <laughs> so 
I mean, an average antigen test um, is costing somewhere between, say, five to eight thousand, uh, depending on where you do it. In some centers, it may be a little higher. So if, if you have to do three for the week, at an average of around seven thousand, that's twenty-one thousand out of your pocket. Um, because I don't know who's gonna pay for these. If it's you gonna pay for it, then the, I mean, it's, there's no uh, harm doing the test, but it's gonna affect your pocket significantly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hope that answered the question. The peep, the peep. Yes, no harm done. <laughs> Just your pocket. No, no, there's no harm. You 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 can't you can't do a test every day. Okay. There's no harm. No harm will be done. No. Got you. In the US, the pay Let me ask you this. Um, a lot of persons had questions and about. Lord, but before you go, Lorna, you can come in on this. Tell us about what's happening in Florida and the state of that test now. <laughs> As okay. someone who had COVID in Jamaica and you're now back in Florida, give us your experience, Lorna. Which test? The antibody test or the PCR test? The antigen. No, the antibody. Oh, the yeah. antigen. Okay, then. Both of them, let's say either or. With insurance, I paid $50 to do the antibody test, which is a, a tighter test. So it, there was a scale. This is high. Sorry. This is high and this is low. And it tells you where on the scale your antibodies are. And I used that at Dr. Hunter's um, urging as a way of deciding if and when I was going to do a vaccination. And once it had fallen below 50%, and it did after 90 days, uh, my, I had natural immunity. So once it passed uh, below 50%, I decided to get uh, a MR, mRNA vaccine. With regards to the PCR tests, I am a member of the media and uh, we move from location to location every other day. So it's, they test us every other day or every two days, depending on um, requirements. The film industry does not want to be shut down again. And uh, we are very vigilant about masks, distancing, sanitizing, and tests. And even with all those precautions, we are seeing breakthrough cases. And the media is, of course, reporting that, you know, breakthrough cases are very rare. From what I am seeing working here on the ground, it is not rare at all. I mean, just this week, I counted 45 people in the in the industry that I'm working with and different crews that we are associated with. And then my assistant- Are vaccinated or unvaccinated, those 45? Oh yes, they are all fully vaccinated. In fact, I'm the only member of my crew that is not fully vaccinated. So um, my assistant this week, um, he called me and said, hey, I have a, I'm spiking a fever. I have aches and pains, sniffing, sneezing and coughing. I said, stop, did you take a test? He said, yeah, I took one today. The next day, the test did not come back in time for his Wednesday job. So I sent somebody to Walgreens. I said, give him a rapid. Uh, we bought a rapid for $20. Uh, we gave it to him. Uh, somebody had him swab his nose, put it in there. So sent me a patient says it's positive. The next day, the PCR test came back negative. I said, no, you're not going to work. I ordered him again to get another PCR test. That PCR test came back positive. He's been grounded. And then he infected six members of his family. And out of that six, only two of them tested positive PCR. The rest of them have all tested negative more than four times since Wednesday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, that's me doubling up on the rapid and the PCR. So, you know, two PCR, two rapids, and I, I even ordered a fifth one. And then the doctor, because one of them went to the doctor, said, oh, maybe you have a cold. And I'm thinking, what are the possibilities that... Four of you out of six who was close relation to uh, my assistant has a cold. So I, I, I actually don't trust the test. It's all I have to work on. I, I try my best um, to be a responsible employer. And I employ all of the strategies that Dr. Hunter has taught me. Um, everybody has the pulsometer. Everybody is steaming. And so including the family, and I call them every day. What is your O2 like? Are you steaming? How do you feel? And um, that's just, this is just life right now with Delta variant and um, a lot of the Delta variant patients that I assume it's Delta variant are actually not showing up on the PCR tests at all. I, I just, if I hear you're sniffing, sneezing, coughing, achy, I just say, stop, stay home. Good. We're getting back there. Thanks, Laura. We're getting, we're getting back to a point of 
of, of clinical management of the uh, these respiratory viruses because in the past, it's not like we didn't have coronaviruses. It's just that we, did, we chose not to spend 20, 30,000 Jamaican dollars diagnosing this virus. We just treat you symptomatically, right? Right, Leroy? How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I, I, I believe in doing the test first to confirm uh, the diagnosis because um, the treatment for, say, the coronavirus that we utilize in our practices is a completely different line of treatment from, say, ordinary cold or, you know, um, other respiratory viruses or infection. So in, in my practice, we, we pay particular attention to make, make sure that we, we do the test to make the diagnosis. But if the patient had clinical symptoms, like Laura just said, the guy, he had his PCR, the first PRS PCR test is negative, but she still insisted that he should follow the, uh, well, be handled as if he was COVID. And we're finding a number of people coming up with negative tests, be antigen or uh, PCR, but we know they have COVID. And then I finally do another test and then you pick it up. What, what you say to that? How do you, are you going to let a patient do three tests? When they, you know, a test is not treatment. They, for instance, I, I will do, months. I will do two, two tests. But again, we have. Um, I, I, I've seen cases like those. I, have, on the third I, I, rec I recommend two tests about uh, seven days apart. I wouldn't do them just like today and tomorrow. I would do them like about seven days apart, uh, just in case the viral load is um, is quite low and it doesn't pick up well. Then, I mean, within seven days, if it goes untreated, it will uh, replicate and then. So if the two tests come back negative, I say definitely it's not uh, not COVID, not COVID nineteen. Oh, they treat I for who their two tests came back negative, and it's the third test that came back positive. I remember what my friend in New York. He did a he had a, he's a nurse in New York. He has a renal patient. The first test is negative. The second patient is negative. They put in a renal line, sent him down to the X-ray. Meanwhile, after the second test is negative. He's touching up the patient's nose, adjusting his oxygen cannula in the nose. And then they did an extra of the chest and it showed the classic white chest, so classic white out. He then they did the third, after that, they then did a third COVID test and it's that test that came back positive. And that's not a unique anecdotal example. That example is given over and over and over. It's replicated several times over. So it's just okay. the importance of your clinical judgment, you know. So yes, clinical judgment, I, and of course, we're going to monitor, monitor them for that en entire uh, fourteen-day period and okay. um, observe observe them. The algorithm has that clinical positive, not COVID test positive, but clinical positive. You have a stuffy nose, coughing. That's this time. It's COVID until proven otherwise. All right, Roger. If I may just put in here. Um, I have to leave now. So I really want to thank all the participants who, who came on this um, uh, forum tonight. As I mentioned in my introduction, uh, this is planned uh, with perfect uh, timing based on what is happening in our country with the increased cases, with the increased hospitalization. And we are here to tell you that we can definitely minimize the hospitalizations. We can minimize uh, the amount of deaths that um, take place. But the big recommendation tonight is that you need to be treated early and you need to be uh, monitored at home. And so your outcome will be favorable and you will get um, faster healing um, from your infection. So I want to thank you all for participating. Um, I hope you uh, benefited from it. I hope you learned a lot from it. We'll be happy to organize another one soon um, as information changes, as new variants come in and we see how they behave. We will have definitely may have to adjust, make some adjustment to our guidelines that we have defined tonight, but we will update you and we will keep you informed and we will see how best we can minimize you going into the hospital and minimize that. So thanks again. Roger will remain on for answer any other questions, but for me, it's good night. And um, thanks again for being on this forum tonight. Thanks, Leroy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, uh, your visionary leadership as well.
And we will definitely be doing this again, probably in another two weeks or so. But I think that there's a great appetite, a great thirst for it. So yes, I'll stay on for a little longer. I have a parent teachers PTA Zoom meeting at 8.30 in the morning, but I'll have enough sleep to be able to make that on time. So I'll stay on just to answer any last questions. And um, you know, until probably about half 12, and just to make sure that people are now properly COVID champions and you understand where we need to be uh, as a country and where the emphasis needs to be, which is in our homes with good supervision, either from a doctor or a nurse or both, as to regarding um, you know, as to regarding how to competently treat COVID. It's really, really important. I really need everybody here to be comfortable with how to approach your neighbor with COVID and what to recommend. All right. Arlene, okay, thank you all again and have a great night. Thank you. Sleep well, sleep well, sleep well. All right, Arlene, Henry, can you unmute yourself? Okay, coming to the end, three more hands. So Arlene, you wanna come, we're gonna come back to Arlene, she's not hearing. All right, Nicole's phone, we're gonna let you unmute. Oh, Arlene is coming. Okay, Arlene, are you Actually, here? it's Andrea. Andrea, oh my God, tiredness. I see, I see, I see it as an L. My eyes are getting... <laughs> so I was wondering if you were talking about me. So good night, oh. everyone. And thank you, doctors, for all that you have done. My question was... Where are you from? Some... Yeah. Mon I'm, Mon I'm Montego Bay. All right, I'm in, in Westland right now, so I'm pretty close. Okay, but if you, if you're not, you're, you're not showing any COVID symptoms, you don't have it because you built a strong immune system based on what you had learned no. prior to COVID. But COVID you also are, are not vaccinated. No, no, no. If you don't have any COVID symptoms, I mean that you don't have right. COVID disease. Oh, okay. I mean that you don't have the virus, you know, it's like the vaccinated. But the key is to keep to be symptom free. That's right. right. I got COVID and I had symptoms. My saturation was 79%. I wasn't okay. weak, but I was weak and had a bad cough. So I was symptomatic. I stayed right. home, treated, steamed, 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 check my sat, check my sat, check my sat, check my sat again and again, steam, 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 never needed oxygen. Every time I steamed, my O2 sat went up to 95, 96, 97%. So it was active monitoring and active treating at home. The point where after two weeks I was symptom free and I've remained symptom free up to this point. My antibody levels are high. Like Laura, you watch your antibody levels when they fall, you then give yourself a booster if you feel it's necessary. But uh, I, I remain under the WHO guidance, which says if you have COVID, you have to wait six months. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for, for, for that. Um, but I also wanted to know what's your recommendation on somebody who is not, not um, you haven't been diagnosed with, with COVID and you have not been vaccinated. What would you recommend that they go and get COVID tested first or do they get vaccinated first? That's a powerful question. Um, I, we really didn't want vaccine questions up front, but uh, I would recommend <laughs> especially in where you have a 50% positivity, which means every other person beside you is COVID positive. I don't want to be where a very prominent journalist who died recently took the vaccine and had COVID, and that ultimately culminated in his death. So therefore, if I were you, I would definitely be taking a COVID test before taking a vaccine and make sure that not one test is negative, but a couple of tests that they are also negative. So we know even on the second test is negative, but then the third test normally comes back positive. So it's a very difficult, very, very difficult. But what you mustn't do is take the vaccine and have COVID at the same time. Oh, okay. So get tested first and then... Expensive. Like it's expensive. It's expensive. It's expensive. But I would choose that route of getting tested first and second and third. That's if you didn't have COVID at all. If you had COVID, right. it doesn't matter. I don't need to be tested. I'll just take the vaccine when my antibody levels fall. I don't need right. to worry about a test. Okay. Well, I'll just look to see on the ministry's website where to go get the test done. 
Okay, in, in Montague Bay, Kingston, in Montague Bay, uh, is it Montague Bay Hospital? Try Montague Bay Hospital, 952 Where is Montague Bay Hospital, 952 The entrance of Corner Regional Hospital. But you can also, you know what, where does it for sure? Bay West Hospital, Bay West, in Ironshore. That's right opposite hospital. Okay. So half moon, it's in a half moon village. Yeah, I think it's ten thousand dollars to do it there. Wow, it's crazy. You may need to shop yeah. around, and ask your own. Is there a micro lab? I think micro labs will be cheaper. There's micro labs in Montgomery on Humber. All right, look. all right, I'll check there then. Okay, thank you for your okay. question. Have a good night. Well, keep listening. All right, you too. Thanks a lot for answering. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Paul, mm -hmm. can I ask you to unmute? Hi. Hi. Good, Good night. night. Um, Andrea, don't leave out the hospital. The last time I heard that they were the cheapest one in Montego Bay. So check them for check them too. All Thanks. right. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. So um, Thanks a lot for okay. that. Oh, you know, doctor, I want to ask you. I'm I'm from Mobe too. Um, how right. many tests should we do before finally? <laughs> figuring out if we do have COVID because you were talking to the other doctor before and you had mentioned three tests. And, you know, if I go and get one before I go and get my vaccine, it's, it can also be a, a negative, even though I might have some sediments within myself. Okay. That's that is COVID. Okay. So three, three you had recommended? Well, I, <laughs> well, you'd say based on statistics, at least three, but what Dr. Heyman is saying, he does two, but he separates them further. So he separates them. He does one now and one one week later. But it wouldn't catch the ones that are occurring like at the second week. The WHO and other people have shown us that if you have the coronavirus in, in exposure, it takes 24, it takes 14 hours for it to become symptomatic. So you go, well, sorry. Let me, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. It takes anywhere from two days the 14 days to become symptomatic. That's why you quarantine for 14 days because okay, they yeah. can still be infected on day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, day 12, you then become positive and just like with the test. So I would recommend perhaps a week apart because money is, is scarce. Remind me of your name, please, Doc. My name is Dr. Dr. Hunter, Dr. Roger Hunter. Remind me of yours as well. It's Andrea Henry. And what's, what's your background? Um, I do sales. I work in the hotel industry. I work in a spa. And, and it's it's almost becoming mandatory for me to get vaccinated. Yeah. I haven't done it as yet because I, I, yeah. I didn't have as much information as I do tonight. I heard a tourism minister. But what you need to do is open his and point him to what's happening in Israel on the third vaccine. I really need, I really, I'm not happy with mandating it, but recommending it. But then to put some, to pay a teacher more because they're vaccinated or to treat one patient different to another patient who is not vaccinated. I, I, I don't think we should enter into that conversation at all. That's why I said no totalitarianism, no uh, dangerous rhetoric of must do this and force them to do this. No, we need to move away. Jamaica has enough problems. We don't want to incite violence. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's that's very true. I've not. Um, I've not. I, I wanted to have more information because of all of the the news that we were hearing with regard to some you know adverse effects on some people from having got the vaccination, and I wasn't convinced. 100% it happens. It's just that the authorities have not always been able to bring the information in a timely, timely manner. It's, it's kind of surprising that it's taken so long to hear the exact details, but we just have to wait until the authorities tell us how many people have suffered an adverse effect from the vaccine locally in Jamaica. All right. It would have been great if we had all the facts and then we could make an informed, you know, decision. That, that is absolutely, no. I, I agree with you 100%. Okay. I like what you say, what you said about going to get tested first before you get the vaccine. 
to experience um, because it. if you've never had COVID before, you need to know that I've you're... never had it and I'm not gonna get it. I work in the sun, so I get a whole heap of vitamin D. Um, and I just I'm a Christian and I believe God for my healing and I believe He keeps me. Believe so I'm not getting COVID. However, I want to be practical. I want to be practical and I want to be oh. smart. 80% of, people, 80% of people are not symptomatic. Right. If they didn't get it, if you need an antibody test, to see that there's no antibody in your blood for COVID. Right. But if you have high antibody levels in your blood, it means you're like Juliet Cuthbert Flynn or Major General Anderson, that they got COVID, but it's so, they are so fit that it didn't cause them to be sick. So that's something you need to bear in mind. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so where do I get the antibody? Um, that is the question you must ask. Where do you get the antibody, which are the proteins that the immune system produce to block the virus from entering your system? The antibodies are specific to the antigen, which is the virus. The antibody test can be done at micro labs in Montreal. Okay. Micro okay. Montego Bay, or okay. it, can done, it can be done at University Hospital of the West. But Micro Labs is one I re recommend readily. Okay, I'll go get that done at Micro Labs. Where do you okay. practice? And if you can have some friends overseas to send you some fancy kit, they're actually fancy kits for antibody tests. Okay, I have friends overseas. Um, but but let me ask, where do you practice, Doc? I practice in Kingston, Mandeville, and Montego Bay, so and virtually everywhere in the world in terms of the virtual space. In terms of my physical practice, it's Oxford Medical Center and Winchester Medical Surgical Institute in Kingston. It's at the consultant wing at Hargreaves in Mandeville. That's a Friday. And it's at Montego Bay Hospital at the top of Mount, uh, Mount uh, Salem, right at the beginning of the old Corner Regional Hospital. Okay, because I'm urology. I'm, okay. All right. Um, thank you so much for all of what you guys have done and for all of you coming together and passing on this information. It's been it well be. needed, well needed. And um, it has helped me to make a better decision concerning everything else. Thank you. And I appreciate it very much. Welcome. All right. Let's get to God bless you. All right. Um, Doctor Doctor Hunter, this is Nicole. Oh. Um, oh my yeah, God. you. <laughs> she <laughs> came right in and she had some really good questions here. I noticed that um, uh -huh. there is not much emphasis on natural herbs because I know that turmeric and ginger, the mixture, will help to um, settle the the, the body. Um, not allow too much swelling, inflammation rather. I, I, when next you speak, is it possible to give us a, a, an insight on the natural herbs that are grown here in Jamaica? As you had said before, this is a pre-treatment or a preventative treatment for poor people. So is it possible that you can get that uh -huh. section covered when next you have one of these um, I definitely, I definitely will address that the next time. Thank you so much. I will say that, though, that it won't be me that will be doing that presentation because I'm a victim of my training. All medical students are victims of their training. All medical I understand. Because herbal and naturopathic medicine has been removed from a medical curriculum 100 years ago. And we know why it was removed. Pilot, right. And they put in um, I am and big pharma. So the herbalists and the company. I know that. I know that. I know that. And um, and so if you can, there's a if you can, there's a naturopath. She call him a herbalist, a naturopathic practitioner. Uh, I right. think it's Ehuti, uh, Mr. Johnson. I think I'm going to get him. Going to reach out Fantastic. to him. He'll be able to come and give us some insight tonight. We had a dentist, and it was amazing just hearing how oral it's health. Amazing. It's absolutely important to reducing viral load in the mouth and reducing your chance of passing on the virus and reducing so your chance of getting sick. And again, I want to reiterate, I want to again call for a month of oral hygiene, intense oral hygiene. Not just brush your teeth once a day, 
three times a day, and, list, and Listerine or whichever mouthwash, three times a day, starting the 21st of August to the 21st of September, we want a 30-day period of regimented oral hygiene. And I'm confident if everybody's doing that, the infection rates will fall and the severity of illness will fall. So again, thank you. I for remember, yes, I specifically remember because I, I grew up here in Jamaica. Lovely. That they promoted oral hygiene all through my primary years into high school. So I don't know when it stopped. Oh, I think so I, I had no idea that it stopped. You know, and they gave out free toothbrushes and, and right. toothpaste and floss and everything. I had no idea that it had stopped. What happened? Uh, the dental nursing program stopped because it made way for the dentist. Because when you were growing up, there was no school of dentistry in Jamaica. Now you have schools of dentistry. Wow. And they have pretty much ended the dental nursing program. So that's sad. So the dental nurses are the ones who used to carry, who carry on that message. But they're still oral hygienists, I think, on a two-year degree at UTEC. They can also carry that program of um, dental hy oral hygiene. Thanks again, Nicole. We just message me, Teresa. Can I... Can I ask two more questions? I, I didn't get the cost of the ozone treatment and I wanted to know when was the best time to do it at the first sign of symptoms or when I catch the virus or if I know anybody who catch the virus. Well, definitely the, should... the earliest, the earliest. You know somebody you start Earliest. To One more thing. Um, how cost, about um, acupuncture, you know cost, acupuncture? I don't know the cost of the Andre Williams. Will okay, I understand. It's in Montague Bay. You can get in touch with I him. Will, I will look him up. How right. about acupuncture and acupressure? Not so sure. Again, I'm not Anything? A, I'm not okay. an osteopathic doctor. Uh, I don't think it would work for viruses. The best I know, even knowing that's a good thing, it can help to provide some level of comfort and reduce anxiety, but it won't get the virus out of your body. So I'm not sure if I would see the basis on which to recommend that or to explore it further. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. I have more questions, but I know that you have to go to bed. So do I. Right. And All everybody right. else on this phone. Thank you so much. Have a great Greetings. night. You too. Have a good night. Evelyn, a question. You're going to be quick. I'm trying to finish up everyone's Greetings. questions. Evening. Good, e yes. good evening. Good evening. Wow. Go ahead. Greetings. Hello. Good evening. Can you more, Evelyn, is it you? With, yes, yes, uh, speaking. Go ahead, quickly. Good evening, and I'm listening to your program, very interesting, and I'm happy I'm on the program. I have a little bit, a kind of personal question, though. I am a teacher from Hanover, and I'm thinking of, uh, if you're thinking of taking the vaccine for back to school, but I have an allergy to Augmentin, do you think it will have any adverse effect on taking the vaccine? There's a chance. Anybody with allergies, they tend to screen you out and say mm -mm, they don't want to take the risk because one of the uh, contraindications is allergies. If you have a history of allergy, they tend not to give you the vaccine. So that would be a legitimate reason to not get the vaccine, especially multiple allergies. So some people are allergic to penicillin and they're also allergic to metals. They're also allergic to other drugs. They say, uh -uh, they don't give the vaccine to people like that. Okay, I have like numbness, of the tongue, and tingling in my body, and needles when I took it. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Because Andrew, with the, the numbness in the tongue, can get swollen and completely block your airway, and that's a no, no. So, mm -mm. Well, I, I don't see how that's an, a contraindication to the vaccine. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's go to the right. server. Sarva, can you unmute yourself? Greetings. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, indeed. Go ahead. Good night, one and all. Good night. Um, I'm a Kingstonian, and I'm oh. also a naturopath. All right. I'm a herbal side. Okay. I've healed quite a few COVID patients. Good. Um, by using natural herbs. Um, I'd like to ask, make a request of you as a doctor and any other doctor who is online to do a case study of your patient's diet. Um, from my observation and what I know personally, 
I look at COVID as a asthma attack. So I'm saying because all the symptoms that I've read and researched are those that people who suffer from asthma has. Full stop. So I'm saying, so I deal with a COVID case like asthma. So I'm saying, um, so firstly, when I, when I asked about diet, um, one of my patients, um, when she was on the hospital bed in good old England, they were giving her cheese, butter, yogurt, Irish potatoes, all the stuff that are high octane boosting fuel for mucus. Man. So I am I am I am of the mind frame if as oh. a part of treating your patients is to tell them that listen, refrain from certain sort of foods mm -hmm. because when the virus comes into a temple, uh, what what you know as a body that is that has what we call bad carbs in it is like party time, big dance a key. Mm -hmm. She was placed on the ventilator. I have to, and, but once you're going to tell me that she, she was placed on the ventilator in England? Yeah, man. And what, what I recommended for her to do and start take, taking, he took her off the ventilator. Oh? Because what I went into is blood cleansing. Okay. So she was so saying, survived. As a matter of fact, my general, she was pregnant. Okay, wow, that's impressive. Yes, sir. I think you need to write. So right now, right now, she's alive. Her baby's alive and healthy and kicking. And currently, she's back in Jamaica and she's nice. Excellent. Well, that's more power. That's more power to you. It's a powerful story. I would, I would write it down and My, see. We can write. I give you this much. My sister is a um well is a frontline worker abroad in the states, and my father is there with her. He's also a natural. Mm -hmm. She contracted the virus, and by three days' time, she was back uh, out at work. Wow! I get box, all the stuff to do to start yeah. her out, and she has a young baby. She has a husband. And both her mother and father and her brother is in the same household, and no one has this, no one has COVID because pops knew what to do, herbally speaking. Yes. We didn't use the same herbs to treat our respective patients. Right. I'm saying, but are the same thing we draw for things to clean the blood. Right. And usually, um, when I'm dealing with the situation, I tell my patient, or even myself, all right, I'll take them bit as a gargle before you swallow. Because the COVID tends to come in a sore throat type of vibe. So mm. does us. It does, it does, it does. So I'm saying, so you tell them, say, gargle, because um, what I've learned over the years is that a part of digestion takes part in your mouth oh, before yeah. it even reaches your stomach. Kylin, yeah. So, yeah, so we need for this goggle, then swallow. Right. And it clears this road. Definitely. So I'm saying also exercise is a great thing. So if you are someone who exercises and get a chance to sweat in the burning sun, that's free vitamin D that you don't have to pay for, provided by nature. Free mental mental therapy to exercise improves mental That's health. right. Which is right, which is something that I practice very often. So my thing is being, and I don't have access to any of the fancy devices that they are them up. So I'm saying, because I, I see you constantly refer to that blue machine that you had there to pulse manage your temperature and everything. Yes. Oximeter. Remember, get the word. Pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter. Yes, yes, I had none of those. But all my patients that I have treated thus far are A-OK. -okay. Excellent. Well, Every we, single one of them. We recommend the pulse oximeter, though, uh, General. I would recommend that. I wouldn't go far from one. Come on. Yeah, man. 
can still I just, I'm just saying I didn't have any of those. No, you but just go by blood cleansers and I'm I mean them these things are really cheap. Excellent. So if I want to have access to if I want to have access to Cersei, Neem, mm. you know, rice bitters, them thing they are blood cleansers, those are blood cleansers, easy thing to get mm. access to, and them cheap. Mm. Try and steam. They're not steam. steam. Steaming yeah. also because yeah, you have eucalyptus oil. Right. You have orange peel. Right. You have garlic. Right. I'm just saying the natural stuff, stuff where you buy, put in your house. Those things work. The, right. the, the main focus is, 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 is about ridding bad carbs from the body, which is a sustenance for mucus out yeah. of the system, out of the body. All right, a server, I have to move on. I don't want to drop off this chair. Yeah, Thank you for your contribution. No problem, General. And uh, just I'll be at the next meeting if you have our next one. We will we can go into the we will yes, because just this, it won't be as long, but that just shows you that there is the need, there's this hunger for the other thing. What about treatment? What can you do? So this just confirms what we all knew that nobody was being told what to do if you become ill. Apart from watch and do nothing, in other words, wait. What about watch and treat? So thank you so much. And look out for the next message. Uh, again, just message me, 361-2686, and so that we can keep in touch and we can post it directly to you. All right. Yeah, again, have uh, a run that number once more for me, please. One more time. One second. 361-2686. So I'll put it in the chat, chat again. 361-2686. 361-2686. 2686. Got that? Six. That's to make the number 2686. All right. Six. Yeah, 361 2686. It's in the chat. It should be right. Very good. 361 2686. That is correct. All right. Um, could you kind of give me your name again, please? Dr. Roger Hunter. All right, so on the massive respect. Every time. All right, uh, have a good one. Yes. Talk again. Likewise. Yes, sir. NG, can we have you on mute? You can mute back. Yeah. Good night, Dr. Matter of fact, good morning. Good morning, indeed. Um, yes. Doctors always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, the vaccine for me is not an option. I wasn't told by a doctor, but based on what I know my body is going through, that's not an option for me, and I don't prefer it, right? Um, I know there are other natural things we can use, for example, um, all the things that were mentioned here, right? Um, vitamins, so forth. Okay, apart from those things that will help the body in fighting, fighting off, um, keeping up the immune system against the infection, what else could I do medically to just try to avoid my body from getting this thing totally? Okay, well, I, you know what I found worked for me very well for a year, and sometimes I would necessarily all be, always be in a mask, was to just simply shower, wash your mouth, Listerine, brush, floss, Listerine three times a day, have showers twice a day where possible. And um, yeah, just sanitize, social distance as well. Um, you know, I think that perhaps can help reduce the um, contraction of COVID, avoiding public um, public celebrations such as parties, mm -hmm. etc. So, is, is there anything medically, like any medicine I can take beforehand? Uh, I want to repeat to you in terms of what the methodologies of hygiene, 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 oral hygiene, body hygiene, oral hygiene, body hygiene. In terms of medicine, ivermectin mm -hmm. has been discussed at length today and perhaps recommend ivermectin in the context. 12 milligrams, baker, uh, 12 milligrams now, 12 milligrams two days later, and 12 milligrams once week going forward until you feel that you no longer are at risk for COVID. Okay, so to do that, I need to, to contact a doctor. Contact a pharmacist and they can arrange the doctor. That's how it oh, works. Okay. So could you be the doctor or someone from here or from the team? Yeah, we're happy you have to prove a positive COVID test. But, you know, first of all, you try to look where are you from? Where are you calling from? Montego Bay. A lot of Montego Bay here today. Certainly, mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, you could, but you know, I can give a doctor, Dr. Jeremy and Spence. He's very good, Spencer at Bay West. Dr. Okay. Garfield Chapman and Lucy is very good as well. But you know, I am in all three counties, uh, Cornwall, mm -hmm. sorry, but you know, if I'm not in Montgomery all the time of the week, so I'd recommend somebody who is more Western based. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't I didn't get the, those names and could I have contact for them? No, I don't I can't give a, a contact. Just message me 3612686 and then I'll message them. And if they say yes, go ahead and give it. I will tell you which I'll I'll come back to you. All right, thank you very much. But I'm encouraging all my doctors to give out the numbers, all of them, because this is a pandemic and people just need basic guidance. Last night I got a midnight text about the O2 SAT. I didn't see it. I went to bed early, got up in the morning, and I was able to still just give some advice, which is very helpful to the person. So have a good mm -hmm. night. And well, thanks for contributing and look forward to further meetings. All right. We're gonna, we're gonna move sure. on. Sure. Tioma. Tioma, you're gonna unmute yourself. Is it the second time? It's, it's Tioma again. And I can see your rocking to keep from falling. I'm really gonna take very little of your time. But I just again want to want to say that you have really restored my faith <laughs> in the medical establishment because so many are just going along with the program and it takes a lot of courage to do what you've done today. And I want you to know we all appreciate it, appreciate, love it. Thank you. Stay strong, stay healthy. And I just want to mention what you said about the the um, mental. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah sure. I believe in it. I, I, I do. Oh, I do. It works. Yes. Yeah, so camphor is wonderful. But, you know, an old fashioned remedy is to tie it or wrap it in a little piece of cloth and on a string, you carry it with you. You carry it around with you. So you're constantly getting the effects, not the steam, unfortunately, not the heat, but the antiviral effects, if you will, of the of the camphor are with you all the time. So that's a good thing. And one more thing I will say, people have mentioned ginger, people mentioned turmeric, you know, the lemon, the whole lemon and um, aloe gel or single Bible. Very good to have them in little bottles in your fridge. So you have the shots ready because if COVID hits, sometimes you may feel so fatigued and so enervated that you are not able to make anything for yourself. But if you have, have a few of those in your fridge, you know, it, it's good to just take the shots and then a package of the steaming herbs so you can easily drop it into water and just sit over it and steam. Um, awesome. All right. I'm going to, yeah. 160 people heard that. They're going to be champions for you. Your methodology, certainly believe the herbal steamings definitely can be used as well. Absolutely. Just want to say people with G6BD deficiency, they shouldn't have camphor balls. It can lead to a crisis. But, but those are very rare, G6PD deficiency. But right. outside of that, by all means, get on with it. Keep, use it, use it, use it. That's right. Uh-huh. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good one. Um, Keith, let's unmute you. We have one more question after Keith, and that, after that we close off. Uh, uh, yeah, Junior, yeah, then we close off. All right, go, go Keith, Mr. Spence. Right. Yes, me again, Doc. Um... Okay, so last year I heard about the hydroxychloroquine very early in the day. CQS, and, hydroxy, hydroxy. Right, and I've been on it <clears throat> in my entire family. Lovely. Um, for it's going 15 months. I think we started last year, March, May, thereabouts, doing 200 milligram once a week. Lovely. We did it like three, three days. And then twice a week for about six months, and then we're down to one once per week. So we've been on that. Lovely. But uh, uh, my, you know, I know we don't want to go into the whole vaccine argument tonight. Uh, we can't take it any further. We did right. a lot. We did a lot. We did a lot. Yeah, the, I, I hear it coming through. <laughs> uh, but we can't do any. We can't do any justice to that conversation. Right. Right. I know. I know. A lot. So. But that, that's my biggest concern, though, at this point. The, the, the whole mandate. But by oh. then, hopefully, the numbers will be coming down from early treatment. 
because you guys all need to be COVID champions, COVID competent, and yeah. getting me the results that people by applying this knowledge, you're going to start saving lives. Uh, well, let me ask you that. This, this is my concern, you know, and it might be a reality. You know, when you dispel the, 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 the rumor or the fear in that, um, say, for example, there are 10 of us in a room. Yeah. All COVID negative. Right. We're not we have not been vaccinated. But there's a study showing now that if one person comes in that has been vaccinated, there's a potential for a shedding. And that that's that and then there's a narrative saying that the unvaccinated is going to you know affect the vaccinated and it, this is this is where you know I have this quagmire and I said this 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 not making sense. Ever heard, you, ever heard ever heard the um ruling that just judgment was reserved? <laughs> Can I leave that one like that? Yeah, that's our word. I with you on that one. You're gonna reserve judgment for a year, but just keep keep the faith, apply the yes, principles, sir. and in, in a year time we can open the yeah, judgment. Yeah, I'm rolling out to so. Very well. Love you, sir, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Be a champion for me. We need about that number for Haiti. I need back. I know, all I heard now is that it's first global, so that's easy for me. Okay. But we need back the, um, in the chat the, the, the account I'll number. Tell you what, message me, WhatsApp, message me, and I will, um, or, or maybe I'll share my slide one last time at the end. If it's no, that's okay. I'll have, I'll have your number. So I'll, share, I'll share the slide one more time for the people of Haiti. And on behalf of the MHH, through medical strategies, we'll get that done. Sir, I really Thank appreciate you. you. God bless you, sir. God bless. Junior, last man, last man standing to bat. Junior on mic. Morning. Mike is here as Junior. Morning, Doc. Good morning, indeed. Yes, I won't, I won't be long. I um, just want to tell you thanks to you and your team for what you have done through your information sharing. Um, and let me just get to the point of my question. How, seeing that school will be in session in a few months, I think September, so, so to speak, what will be the approach from the, 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 the doctor side, the medical side in terms of how to mitigate or to prevent or to give awareness education to, to students um, and teachers alike during this the, the, the school setting, because now they are saying that they're looking on face-to-face -face, um, resumption. So I was wondering, is it that a suggestion could be made where um, classes could be held outside in the sunlight? I mean, don't know how feasible that would be. On the tree. But in terms of getting the sunlight, you know, an open ear, you know, as opposed to be in the classroom, probably AC or the fan in, in an enclosed area. Can I assume you know, no AC? Uh, no AC. But uh, you get the picture where I'm coming from. So is there a plan where the medical, the, your, your, your team will, you know, sensitize or educate from this aspect. All right, one of the, thank you for that question. It's a very complicated, complex and heavy question. All right, the reason why I'm here, one of the reasons why I'm here, it relates to the fact that there is an election going on. And that's the election to become the next president elect of the MAJ. As it stands now, I am one candidate who has a visible campaign. The other candidate who is from Montserrat is refusing to, to debate. He refuses to come to Jamaica, to Jamaicans or residents of Jamaica and say exactly. He's a nice guy though, very, very nice guy, very nice and warm and gentle human being. Nothing's wrong with that, but we need to have a debate. The point is the direction is important. Is it that the current MAJ president who echoes the, echoes this, the, the sentiments that lockdown, lockdown, take a joke? No regards to the children that have been left behind. No elements of any expression of the 120,000 children that have been left behind. So what I would definitely want to do is to, if I am successful, and hopefully I will be, is to change the tone of the MAG 
to one of support and solution finding. And one solution finding is to make sure every single teacher in Jamaica up and down will have the number, the contact number of a doctor. Yeah, most Jamaicans do not have the contact number, the personal contact number of a doctor, and that needs to change. And that's something to agreement and consensus we can change if I become the next leader of the MAJ. And I'd like to certainly encourage uh, the other person to engage with the debate. There's nothing wrong to come from another country. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that you need to come and say, do you believe in mandating for vaccination for children? Do you need believe in mandating pregnant women? What is your policy, policy position? And how have you treated with COVID? How have you helped the conversation on COVID? How have you helped people to gain, or even the government to gain some better understanding or a new perspective on COVID? So to, and to influence that conversation, Junior, I need to be at the table. If I'm not at the table, then the degree to which I can influence the, uh, the conversation around helping children and students go back to school is, is limited. And the current president of a high school, of the PTA, I, even then you can't really speak too publicly on the matter because you, you don't want to you know, create any issues for the students and you, want, you don't want to create intentions among the staff. So the best platform is a relatively neutral MAJ platform. And if that becomes a reality, and I hope it does, because I've worked really hard to make sure it, to try and make sure it does, so if it becomes a reality, then you're going to hear more moderate and solution-oriented uh, approaches. And again, one of them is to make sure every teacher in Jamaica up and down has access to a doctor. Every teacher must have a pulse oximeter. There are many teachers have already treated. In fact, two from Hanover will tell you that they had COVID. They applied the treatment, the sunshine, the uh, steaming, and it really, really worked. I was hoping that they would be able to log on, but you know that really is important to help with the uh, solution as to getting kids going back to school. Like, earlier in the year, earlier in the year, you would have heard me at striking a different tone. I was a lot more annoyed and angry, but I was very adamant in calling for the reopening of all sports. And you will see, if you go on YouTube, you will see the videos reopening all sports. And we persisted, we persisted. And I'm happy that this year we had champs followed by national trials followed by the Olympics, and it came home with nine gold medals. So sports, so oh, sports is going to be a super spreader event. Well, sports has not been a super spreader event. Sports actually was a vehicle for uh, enjoyment, for happiness, for mental healing. And so I think the teach children going back to school will be more good than the negative. The, you know, people will be happy that they're at school, and the pain of educational loss will be lessened. And you know, really and truly, children are not the epicenter for any coronavirus. So I would definitely be looking towards reopening schools as the uh, main thing that I'll be tilted towards and not to, to say lockdown, lockdown, keep children out of school. So that you're gonna hear a more moderate voice, a more balanced voice on this matter. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Most welcome. All right, I will, but you go out and influence your doctors, whoever you can. All right, okay. Well, well Co-Chair Lorna, I'm going to leave you to just say a few words, and then I'll say the final word, and then I'll sign off for tonight. Thank you, everybody. Lorna from Florida. Keep we us have uh, lost about 50% uh, of the viewers, but for those who are still around, um, I'd like to say thank you for sticking around. And all the doctors who participated today in the discussion, thank you very much. Just want to emphasize, you can follow Dr. Hunter at Dr. Roger Hunter on Twitter. There you go. A lot of people are asking for brochures, flyers, what to do um, to be prepared. You know, so uh, I'm hoping that as we continue the discussion, more of this information will get out and um, a lot of it will be posted on social media. So if you're interested, please follow Dr. Hunter on Instagram or Twitter. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you very much again. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for staying up. You've been really good. Yeah, I know you have had a long day and you probably have an early <laughs> early day tomorrow, I hope not, but you know, you've been really good. And I want to thank you as somebody who had COVID when I had COVID and we both treated together and we can live to tell the story. And so I salute you for 
blessing so many people in Florida with your knowledge and your wisdom. And uh, um, uh, for me, I'd also like to thank everyone as well. Again, echo your uh, salutations and gratitude. I want to thank everybody for coming, for staying the course, for listening to what we're saying, and hopefully for being empowered. And at the end of the day, you're all now COVID champions, COVID competent and COVID champions. All right. God bless. Get home safely until we uh, meet again. Listen out for listen out for more videos. We're also going to post on YouTube this video, and we're also going to ask you to like, share, like, share our other videos on YouTube, particularly the early early uh, early home and community based treatment of COVID. Early home and community based treatment of COVID. We need that video to really really go viral. We need it to go everywhere early. Uh, home and community-based treatment of COVID, Dr. Roger Hunter, was 11th of August. When that video goes viral, we're going to start hearing the politicians changing their tone and that we, the people, will eventually start getting a more moderate action in terms of their approach to COVID. And Indeed. And we'll also be uh, live stream, not live stream, it was uh, placed over YouTube for people to see, but I'll probably chop it up into segments. So again, a big thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for coming. Thanks everyone. Until we see you again, be safe, be empowered, be COVID champions. God bless. Have a good night.